Do you want to develop a React admin dashboard that updates in real time across devices? Hi there, and welcome to another project-based tutorial where you'll build an admin dashboard with full authentication, including forgotten password, a homepage showcasing charts, upcoming events, and latest activities, a comprehensive table for companies with full CRUD operations and search capabilities, a full CRUD Kanban board with multiple assignees and deadlines that shift automatically. And for everything mentioned so far, real-time synchronization for lightning fast updates like in a real-world admin dashboard. You'll build and learn all these features using React, GraphQL, TypeScript, and Design, and Refine. And before we dive into the development, Let's see how the app works. We have this good looking login where you can input your details. If you put something wrong, you'll see a toast on the top. I will now use the right credentials and there we go, we're in. Did you see that? That subtle smooth chart animation? Let me refresh and show it to you again. How nice. We can also see deals lost and won in that month on that chart. On the left side, we also have upcoming events and below that are latest activities all coming from the backend. On the companies page, you'll see a list of all the companies we've closed deals with or that are currently in progress. If you need to find something specific, there's a handy pagination feature and a search option for the company title. Now, when it comes to managing these companies, the power is in your hands. You can view and edit their details check out the associated leads, and even perform targeted searches within the leads section. And hey, if you're done with a company, you can easily delete it. Over here at the top, we can register a new company. Now check this out. I'll open the same site in two browsers, create a company in one, and bam, changes happen instantly in the other. No need to refresh. And it's not just about creating stuff. It works for any changes you make in the app edits, deletes, moves, drag and drop, you name it. It's all about keeping things seamless, efficient, and real time as they should be. Next, we have a complex Kanban board that could be a whole app in and of itself, like Trello or Jira. Here, we use it to handle all internal company tasks, easily drag and drop tasks, check deadlines and tweak details by assigning to others, adjusting dates, marking as complete, or removing from the list entirely. You can also create these tasks in real time and modify all the details from the title, description, and date that changes colors according to how close it is to the deadline, with the ability to have multiple assignees on the same task. You can also modify your account details from here. Everything you see works well on any device, giving you a smooth experience, whether you're on your computer, tablet, or phone. And all of this was made possible by Refine, without which building this powerful dashboard would have been a long and difficult task. With Refine, we can rapidly develop many kinds of web apps like internal tools, admin panels, B2B apps, dashboards, and any type of CRUD application. What makes Refine special is that it comes packed with ready-to-use hooks and components. This means faster development because you don't waste time on repetitive tasks. Using this modern hook-based architecture and a system of providers, we can implement all the industry standard solutions required for a project like authentication, roles, routing, networking, state management, and even internationalization all in the simplest way possible. And it's not just me who thinks this way. Refine has become the fifth most used technology in the React ecosystem right after Next.js and Zustand. Now, you may wonder about the prerequisites for this tutorial. All you need is a good grasp of JavaScript and React. And if you don't have it yet, don't fret. Check out the crash courses on YouTube to get up to speed. So without further ado, let's dive right into the code. To get started building our amazing dashboard, you can open up an empty Visual Studio Code window and then open up the terminal. Then run the command npm create refine dash app at latest and press enter. It's going to ask you whether you want to install the create refine app to which we're gonna say why, as in yes. It's going to take a moment 
And immediately after, we got this great animation. They said make it work, make it right, or make it fast. With Refine, we're already there. Okay, that's a nice touch. Now, the remote source has been downloaded successfully, and we can choose a project template. In this case, we're going to proceed with Vt, as we don't necessarily need many built-in benefits that Next.js provides. Of course, if you want to, you can always switch it up later, or you can try it on your own by building a Next.js version of this project. Anyway, let's proceed with Vt. The name for our project can be the default name that they provide, Heavy Bat Sort. And here, we can choose what do we want to use for our backend service. You have many options such as REST API, Nest.js, GraphQL, Strapi, Supabase, Medusa, anything you might need. In this case, we can proceed with Nest.js, as there are some specific things I want to teach you. Next, we have to choose a UI framework. Now, we have a lot of options to choose from. You can go headless and then do whatever you want. But in this case, I'm going to go with Add Design as I think it fits this dashboard theme very well. For the authentication logic, we're going to go with the custom mock auth provider. In this case, we won't be needing internationalization. And here, if you want to, you can give them your email, such as contact at jsmastery.pro and press enter. Next, all of the packages are going to be installed based off of the decisions that you've made in the CLI installation process. So pause this video, give it a few moments, and I'll be right back. And there we go. To start developing, we can CD into the folder name, heavy bat sort, and I would highly recommend that you press and hold control or command, and then join Refine's Discord server. This is the best place to get your questions answered and your bugs resolved. Once you join the Discord server, we want to open up this directory within our Visual Studio code, as we're not there yet. So hold control or command and then click right here. It should open it up right away or just find the folder manually and drag and drop it into your Visual Studio Code window. Once we're here, let's open up the terminal and run npm i to install all the necessary dependencies and then npm run dev to get things going. Immediately, we can see that we can again get help from the Refine team and we are live on localhost 5173. There we go, welcome aboard, configuration is completed. We have the docs, tutorials, examples, and community. It is looking great. You might have spotted a small refine element. That's Refine's DevTools. And it's here to improve our experience while developing. To see how it helps, let's click on it and expand it to see it in its full mode. It'll prompt us to sign in to view the content. So just make an account using any social auth provider and here we go. While it's still in beta, there are two major features released. The first feature is the package overview. It shows us all of the refine related packages in our app, but it also lets us update those packages if newer versions are out. Luckily, as of this recording, we're using the latest versions, so no updates are needed. But keep an eye on it while working on the project. If there's an update, hit the button, and you'll be set with the latest packages and their dependencies. Now, the second feature I like is called monitoring. Click on it and you'll see your apps, queries, and mutations used via hooks. You can see if they succeeded, failed, or what kind of info they're bringing back all in one place. Currently, there might be nothing visible because we haven't set up anything yet. But if I tweak the filters here and include both data and auth, we'll start seeing something like this we can see the two hooks we have initialized before. If you click on it, you'll get additional details about the hook. You'll also notice there are three upcoming features, Playground, Inference Preview, and an AI Assistant. So keep an eye on them as they seem quite promising. For now, let's continue with our app and we'll later see how this tool truly works when we start implementing some features. But now we have to turn this into a real dashboard. And to do that, we'll first start by exploring our existing code base. Of course, everything is within the source folder. Here, we have our components, such as the header and the index exporting it. We have our contexts for the color modes, and we have our pages. We also have our auth provider and more. But in this case, we want to remove almost everything we were given at the start. And we want to start from the bare beginnings. 
So let's remove the components folder by deleting it, the contexts as well, and finally the auth provider too. Then if we go into the app.tsx, we'll see that we have some errors. So of course we have to remove the imports as well as removing all of the places where those imports were mentioned, such as in this color mode context, as well as in this auth provider right here, which for now we can comment out. Next, we want to remove all of these imports as well as the references to those imports. So let's comment out these right here. And as you can see, refine will complain as its TypeScript interfaces know that it's missing this specific type. But don't worry, we're going to create all of these providers in separate files. Providers are Refine's building blocks that help you manage different aspects of the application, such as data fetching, authentication, routing, notifications, real-time updates, and more. Data provider, in this case, deals with getting data from the server and doing things like adding, changing, or deleting data. It also handles caching, like storing information temporarily and making sure everything is up to date. A typical data provider workflow looks like this. You can connect your API to the data provider and it'll handle the rest by making HTTP requests or caching data. In our app, we'll set up a data provider that syncs our GraphQL API via a GraphQL client. We'll take it a step further by creating a custom data fetch function. This function allows us to set headers and handle errors efficiently. It acts as a wrapper around the core fetch function. You can also think of it as middleware. This way, we avoid scattering try-catch blocks all over the app and make our development process more scalable. And once the provider is ready, we'll tell Refine that this is our data provider of choice. That way, Refine calls the custom data fetch function automatically whenever we use one of the built-in hooks for doing any sort of data fetching or form submissions. So let's start with this data provider, a provider that is responsible for providing data to the entire application. Any queries or anything related to data fetching will be made within the data provider. So to get started, let's create a new folder within the source folder called providers. And within it, let's create a new folder called data. And finally, within data, a file called index.tsx. This is the place where we're going to set up this data provider from scratch. So we can first start by creating and exporting the client. Export const client. This is going to be a GraphQL client to make requests to the GraphQL API. So we can say is equal to new GraphQL client, which we need to import from refine dev nest.js query. And we can open it up right here by calling it and providing some additional options to it. But before passing the options, there is an additional parameter. It is the API URL. So we know which URL are we calling the data from. So let's define it above. Export const API URL is equal to a string. And now we can define it like so. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash API dot CRM dot refine dot dev. And now we're referring to this API URL right here. Next, we can expand this options object and we can define a fetch query. This is going to be a callback function that accepts a URL of a type string, options of a type request init, which is a built-in interface. Then we can provide the function block and we can open up a try and catch block. In the error, we can simply return promise.reject error as error like that. And in the try, we'll try to make a successful request by saying return fetch wrapper to which we need to pass the URL as well as the options. And now there are a couple of unknowns here. Where is this fetch wrapper coming from? Well, that's something that I'm going to teach you how to build. So going right here to providers and still within the data, we want to create a new file called fetch dash wrapper dot ts. And within it, we want to create this custom fetch that is wrapped around the fetch that adds the authorization header. So this is why we're creating it. Const custom fetch is equal to async 
where we have the URL of a type string, and we also have options of a type request in it. And finally, we have a function block. Creating a custom fetch is very useful for making requests to the GraphQL API, improving code reusability, because we can define some specifics that are gonna happen on every single fetch that we make. In this case, we wanna add authorization headers. So first, let's try to get the access token from the local storage by saying const access token is equal to local storage dot get item. And then we're going to try to get the access underscore token. Next, we want to get the headers from the options object by saying const headers is equal to options dot headers. And just so TypeScript doesn't complain, we can say as record that's going to have a string and then another string. So we're creating a type right here. Now that we have the headers and the access token, we can return the fetch request with the added authorization headers. Return, await, fetch, that fetches the original URL that we passed to this custom function, and then we pass additional options. We spread all the options we pass to any request, and then we also provide the headers, inside of which we first spread all of the headers that we pass and then add this additional authorization header that's not going to be bare token by default. It will be if we don't have anything else. But for now, what we can do here is get it straight from the headers by saying headers question mark dot authorization, or we can do a bearer with the access token. And we can also set the content type right here. That's going to be content type of application JSON. Now, you know how often we experience those course issues, cross origin request policy, something like that, right? Well, to immediately avoid those, we can use something known as Apollo. Apollo is a GraphQL client that we use in the front end to make requests to the GraphQL API. So right after the content type, we can say Apollo dash require dash preflight, and we're gonna set it to a string of true. There we go. Next, we want to build a comprehensive error handling solution. Since we'll be working with a lot of data and we want to know if we're getting the data back from our GraphQL queries. So we can say const get GraphQL errors, like so, which is going to be a function once again. This function is going to accept some params. The first param is going to be a body which is of a type record, which we can expand with errors. And the second one is a GraphQL formatted error, which is going to look something like this. There we go. And we can get an array of those. Or we can simply say undefined right here. We can close it. And now that we have all the params we need, we can also define what the function will output. And that's going to be either an error or a null. And then we can start defining the function block. Within it, we can check if there is no body. In that case, we can return an object that has a message equal to unknown error. And we can also add a status code of something like internal underscore server underscore error. Now I can notice we have some warnings right here. And I can notice that the GraphQL formatted error is not yet imported. So right at the top, we can say import inside of curly braces, GraphQL formatted error coming from GraphQL. There we go. Now we want to do a second check if the body has errors. So we can say if there is errors in body, in that case, we want to get the errors from the body by saying const errors is equal to body question mark dot errors. And then we want to join the errors into a single string by saying const messages is equal to errors question mark dot map where we get a single error. And then we get its message by saying error question mark dot message. And then we want to call the dot join outside question mark dot join right here like this. This is going to turn all the error messages into one. Then we want to get the error code by saying const code is equal to errors, question mark dot zero, question mark dot extensions, question mark dot code. And then we want to return an object 
that has the message equal to either the messages that we created or just the json.stringify of all the errors, like so, in case we cannot get the messages. And then we can also do a status code of either code or let's do a 500 if we don't know which code it is. Now, this error right here, although it is an interface, we don't really know what it contains. And it doesn't include undefined, it doesn't contain the message, status code. So let's create our own type of error right here at the top by saying type error is equal to an object where we have the message of string and we have a status code of string as well. And now it should complain a bit less, as you can see right here. The only thing I'm missing is the double straight line right here, and we are good. Finally, if we have the body or if we don't have any errors, we can simply return a null. There we go. Now our function is happy and we can use it and fuse it with the custom fetch. So right here below, we can create a fetch wrapper. Const fetch wrapper is equal to an async function that accepts the URL of a type string and the options of a type request in it. Then we make the request using the custom fetch by saying const response is equal to await. We use the custom fetch function we have created, pass the URL and the options. And after we wanna use a special function called response clone. Having a clone of the response is useful because once you've read the body of a response, for example, by calling response JSON, you can't read it again because the response is consumed. So if you wanna process the response in multiple ways, you need to clone the response first. Good to know, right? So we can do const response clone is equal to response.clone. There we go. And now we can do something with it. We can, for example, get the body by saying const body is equal to await response clone.json. And then we can get the errors by saying const error is equal to, we call our function get GraphQL errors and we pass in the body. And finally, if there is an error, we simply throw it, else we return the response. So what we have done now is we have spent all this time creating something that will help us a lot in the long run. We have created our own custom fetch function. You can think of it as middleware because it's gonna be happening on top or before every single fetch that we make. And we have also upgraded it with the custom error handling function, which now we have all in this nicely packaged fetch wrapper, which we can export from this function, close the file, and finally be back where we're calling it for the first time. So let's now import the fetch wrapper from the dot slash fetch wrapper. And as you can see, we're calling this request and it's just so simple to call it. You pass the URL and the options, but the authorization is gonna happen automatically and the error handling will also be done. Now, we also wanna make something known as a web socket that's going to listen to subscriptions to this GraphQL API. So whenever the changes happen, we wanna immediately listen to them. Now, before we implement this web socket, I wanna tell you why we're doing this within the data provider. In Refine, similar to the concept of data provider, there is a built-in provider named Live Provider. It allows your app to update in real time. For example, when a user adds something, others can see it right away without refreshing the page. Similar to what we did in the data provider, we'll create a WebSocket GraphQL client using a library called GraphQL WS and provide the WebSocket URL it should listen to. All of this we can then pass to Refine and tell it to listen to changes in real time. One thing we can keep in mind along with the configuration of the live provider is to activate live features in Refine, which we can do by turning on the live mode. Now let's get back to the code. And we can do that by saying export const ws for WebSocket client is equal to, and now we only wanna do this if the type of window is not equal to a string of undefined. So if we do have the access to the window, meaning if we're on the web browser, in that case, we can open up the ternary operator and call a function called create client, which will be coming from right here, import create client, and that's coming from GraphQL, but this time dash WS 
for WebSocket. Now within our create client, we can pass an object of options where first we have to pass the URL, which is going to be another variable we can create. It's going to be called WS URL. So we can say export const WS URL is equal to WSS colon forward slash forward slash API dot CRM dot refine dot dev forward slash GraphQL. So the refine team was kind enough to expose both the API URL and the WS URL for us so we can immediately use them. We'll also need something known as a base URL by saying export const API base URL is equal to that's going to be HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash API dot CRM dot refine dot dev. And now I believe we should have everything we need. So we can pass the URL of this WebSocket client right here as WS underscore URL. And next, we have to set up the connection params, which is going to be a callback function where we get the access token, const access token is equal to local storage that get item access underscore token, like so. And now that we have the access token, we return it. We return an object where we have the headers. And within the headers, we have the authorization with a bearer access token. Or at the end, we can return undefined in case we're not within the browser. So now we got the authorization handled as well as error handling. So let me collapse this right here. Let me collapse the client as well. And the last thing we want to do is create a data provider to make requests to the GraphQL API. So we can do that by saying export cons data provider is equal to GraphQL data provider inside of which we pass the client. And this GraphQL data provider is coming directly from Refine. So let's import it right here at the top before the named imports. So right here, GraphQL data provider. It's a default export. So we need to import it like this. This is a function that takes a GraphQL client and returns a data provider for Refine to use. And then we need to create a live provider to make subscriptions to the GraphQL API. And similarly, to create a live provider, we need to create a variable and then call the GraphQL live provider inside of which we pass the WS client, which is our WebSocket client. And of course, we can import this right here from the Nest.js query. We can put it in a new line and we can say live provider as GraphQL live provider, like so. There we go. And of course, we can only call this if the WS client actually exists. If it's undefined, we cannot call it. So we need to add a ternary right here and say if WS client, then call it, else return undefined. There we go. So now we have both of these data providers, which if you remember correctly, we completely deleted before. And now we're ready to come back and add them within the refine component, which is the entry point of our refine application. As you can see, only a data provider is required to bootstrap the app. And that's exactly what we have done right now. So let's get to our data provider by first exporting it from the providers. We can do that by creating a new file within the providers called index.ts. And within it, we can say export everything from dot slash data. And now we can import it right here at the top by deleting these previous imports and saying import data provider as well as live provider coming from providers data, or we don't even have to say data because we exported it from there. And now we can use it right here. That's going to be data and live provider. We can delete both of these and then say data provider for the data provider. And then here for the second one, we can use the live provider. Great. Now save the file and go to localhost 5173. Our app is working again after all this work, but now at least fetching the data will be much, much easier since we have complete error handling. Now there is one more provider that we have here that is left commented out, which is the auth provider. As the name suggests, auth provider takes care of letting users log in 
and control what they can do based on their permissions. It manages things like redirecting users and handling errors. We have the flexibility to integrate with any kind of third-party authentication, such as Auth0, Okta, and others, or implement your own custom auth methods. If remember, while setting up this project, we choose custom option. That's what we'll do now. We'll create an auth provider object having all the necessary methods from login, check, which is responsible for checking if the user is authenticated or not, login, register, error, and even get identity, which provides authenticated user information. We'll create all these methods and call our GraphQL endpoint, aka the data provider, for complete, foolproof authentication. Now, let's see how we can do that in action. Now, let's go ahead and develop our own auth provider. To implement the auth provider, we can create a new file within providers called auth.ts. And for this one specifically, I've took the time to create it beforehand and provide a lot of comments along the way so that we can simply paste it and fully understand what it is doing. So in the readme down below, you'll be able to find the complete auth.ts file. It's about 150 lines, but if you dive deeper into it, you'll see that a lot of it are comments. So now that we have it here, let's look into it in detail together. First, we're importing the auth bindings from Refine Dev, and then also the API URL and the data provider from the dot slash data. Then for demo purposes and to make it easier to test our app, we can use the following auth credentials, Michael Scott at dundermifflin.com and demo demo as the password. Next, we create our auth provider by creating a couple of different methods on it, such as login, logout, on error, check, and get identity. Login is pretty self-explanatory. Here, we call the login mutation, where the data provider.custom is used to make a custom request to the GraphQL API, which will then call the data provider, which will go through the fetch wrapper function. I know a lot of providers and wrappers already, but we have to do this at the start because as the refund component says, only a data provider is required to bootstrap the app. Once we have that, you'll see how easy it is to continue. So we're setting the auth by calling the data provider.custom, getting the data and doing a post request with the variables of email and doing a raw mutation to return the access token of that user. Then we set the access token to the local storage, set the success flag to true, and redirect to the home page. That is it for the login. Logout is also pretty self-explanatory. Its goal is to remove the access token from local storage. Next, we have the on error, which is additional error handling. And finally, we have the check, which is used to get the identity of the user to know whether we're currently authenticated or not. If we are, we redirect to home, else we redirect to login. And finally, we have the get identity, which is used to get all of the information for that specific user. Here, we return the information such as name, email, job title, phone, avatar URL, and everything else we might need about the currently authenticated user. And that's it. That's the entire auth provider. Now we can go right here to the index.ts of the providers, and we can also export everything from dot slash auth, we can go back to our app.tsx and under auth providers, we can add our auth provider coming from dot slash providers. And now our refine component is happy because it has everything it needs. Now, the last thing we'll have to do before we start creating our routes is set up a workflow for TypeScript so that we don't have to write types on our own. For that, we'll use GraphQL's code gen allowing us to automatically generate types for everything in just a single command. It's this one, mpmi-d for development, and then we add the GraphQL code gen CLI. So let's copy it, open up the terminal. Let's open up a new split window, make sure that we're in there and then paste it. It also requires additional imports, now that that is installed, we'll also need some additional imports. Down in the description or in the readme down below, you'll be able to find a command that's going to allow us to install a couple more dev-related packages. These packages include CodeGen TypeScript, 
which allows us to generate base TypeScript operations, which is also a plugin for GraphQL code generator used to generate typings for operations, such as queries, mutations, and subscriptions, as well as GraphQL CodeGen import types preset. This one is used to optimize the way that types are imported in generated files. These three packages work together to provide comprehensive type safety for our entire application with the help of GraphQL schemas. Finally, we also add Prettier and Vite TS config path. This is used to allow us to create references to files when importing them, such as coming from add forward slash src instead of typing da 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 and so on. This is coming out of the box with Next.js, but not with Vite, so we have to add this additional package. With that said, let's simply press enter to install them. And let's get ready to create our first routes. Let's add a couple of routes right here next to our welcome page. This is where all of the routes in your refine application go. So let's create a new route as a self-closing component. Say that it's going to be index and we can give it an element, which is going to point to home in this case. It's going to be a self-closing home component, which we can import right at the top from dot slash pages. So let's do it right here. Import home within curly braces coming from dot slash pages. But now if we go into the dot slash pages, there is nothing there. So let's see what do we have. We do have forgot password, login, and register, but we're missing home. So let's create it by following the example of how all of these other pages have been created. We can do that by creating a new folder called home. And then we can create a new index dot TSX right within it. We can run just RAFCE to create a simple react error function component, and we can call it home. There we go. Now let's go ahead and export all of these pages from the pages folder. We can do that by creating a new file within the pages directory called index.ts. Within it, we can type export everything from dot slash home. And we can repeat this for all of the other pages. That's going to be home, but also for God password. After that, we're going to have login and finally register. What this allowed us to do is to now import all of these pages within a single line home, forgot password, login, and register. And thankfully, these three pages have already been created for us by Refine. So now let's see why do I have an error here? Module dot slash pages has no exported member home. Oh, I know why that is. The way we're exporting pages in Refine, if you check out, for example, forgot password, you can see that it is export con something instead of export default, which means that our page right here, our home, also has to be export const right here, not necessarily export default, which allows us to have multiple exports from a single file. So now if we go back right here, you can see that it's no longer complaining and TypeScript knows that this is a JSX element. Now let's scroll down to where we have our routes and let's duplicate it three more times for our forgot password, for our register, as well as our login. It kind of makes sense to have register first and then login and then forgot password. Index here simply means that we're showing it on the index page, but these other ones will be showing on some other pages. So we need to add a path to that specific route, which in this case will be forward slash register then forward slash login, and finally forward slash forgot dash password. If you want to, we can explore these three pages and you can see they're simple pages that build on top of the refine dev and design. So we have our auth page with the type login where we pass some additional props. And you can also go through it if you really wanna see what this auth page is made of. It can be a forgot, update, login, and so on. 
But in this case, this has been abstracted for us by Refine so we can focus on what matters, which is building the business logic, building the dashboards, and not focusing on doing the same steps that we have to do in every single application, such as building out auth. So now that we finally have a couple of routes, let's try to see how this looks like in the browser. On our localhost 5173, we have the welcome page that we've had before, but now we should also have forward slash login. And there we go, we have a beautiful login page built for us right out of the box. We can also immediately navigate to sign up, which points to forward slash register, as well as going back to sign in, and then even forgot password too. Now, if we go to sign in, we can see that some demo props have been passed in, and we can try to sign in. Right now, we have a 404, but don't worry, we can start focusing on that right away. I put my browser side by side by our code editor so we can immediately see all of the changes that we make. I'm gonna zoom it out just a bit so we can see everything clearly. And I hope the text is still visible. If you want me to bump it up in the next video, just let me know. So now let's go into login since that's what we wanna fix. Instead of passing the demo initial values, we can take the ones coming from our providers, such as auth credentials. And we can automatically import these credentials coming from dot dot slash dot dot slash providers. We have created these before, remember? If we go to auth, you'll be able to see that here, for demo purposes, we are exporting these auth credentials, Michael Scott and demo demo. So now if we go back, you can notice that we're using these. Now, since the login is connected to our auth credentials and our auth credentials to our own auth provider, we are almost ready to start signing in. But before that, let's quickly visit our data provider, which is defined right here under data provider. Command click it or control click it. And let's make just one small change. I noticed that both my API base URL and the API URL are exactly the same, but the API URL should be the GraphQL endpoint of this base URL. So we can instead write it like this. We can make it a template string, then use the variable of API base URL and then append the forward slash GraphQL to it. So now this is going to be our real GraphQL API endpoint. Now, if we have done it, we can close all of the existing files and just keep our app.tsx opened. Or rather, we are right now on login. So let's see what happens if we try to log in with our existing auth credentials. I'm gonna click sign in and welcome aboard. This means that we have been successfully redirected to our welcome page, which means that the auth is now fully functional. Not only that, we are ready to get started with developing our homepage. And by homepage, I actually mean our whole app layout and the setup of authenticated and not authenticated routes. If you think about it here, we only have home as well as all of the auth routes, but there are so many routes that our final application will have. So let's go ahead and add them right away. First, we can start with the header component as it will be visible on all of the other pages. So this is the first time that we're diving into the components folder, which we first have to create. So you can right click the source folder, create a new folder called components. And within the components folder, we can have another folder called layout. Here, we're gonna keep all of the layout components, such as the headers, sidebars, and more. Then create a new header.tsx file within it and run RAFCE. If this didn't work for you, it must mean that you don't have the ES7 Plus React Redux React Native Snippets extension installed. So install it, reload, and then you'll be able to quickly create React components. With that said, rename it to uppercase Heather as it is a component after all. And then let's get started with creating it. Now, this header, why do we need it? Well, first, we need to verify whether we have successfully signed our user in. So we can do that by creating a new component within the header called current user. So let's do that right away. We're going to create a new special component within the layout folder called current-user.tsx. 
This is also going to be a React arrow function component, but of course, it's not going to be named current dash user, it's just current user. Now, this component, when clicked, will return something known as a pop over. So let's first wrap everything in an empty React fragment, and then let's return a pop over component right within it. This pop over is coming directly from add D, short for add design. Also, from add design, we can also get a button. We're just getting used to using add design. And if you're not familiar with add design, it's just add.design on the internet, and it's a UI kit, similar to Material UI or something like ShotCN for Tailwind. It has a lot of these components out of the box, and it's exceptionally useful for dashboard like applications like the one we're building today. So it's definitely a cool tool to learn. And if you want to learn about a specific component we're using, you can go to components and then you can search for it right here in the components overview. Let's go for pop over and you can see what a pop over is. You can click it and there we go. When to use, it is a simple pop up to provide extra information or operations. For example, if you hover over this button, you'll be able to see a pop over. That is basically it. The reason why I'm going over this with you is because I don't want to teach you just how to develop this specific application. I want to teach you how to think for yourself. And reading the documentation is one of the most important parts of being a developer. So now we're using this pop over and you can even go a step further and expand the code and see how to use it. That's exactly what we're going to do together right now. You don't have to read it from here as I'm going to teach you, but in case you want to do that, you can. So now let's figure out how to create this pop over. Pop over has a couple of props, things like placement, the title, the content, and more. So let's start with the placement. We can do that by defining a simple placement prop on it, which is going to be equal to bottom right in our case. We can also give it something like a trigger. When will the pop over open? In this case, it's going to open on click. Then we can also do something like an overlay inner style. This allows us to change the styling of specific parts of this pop over. So we can say something like padding is zero. And we can also add the overlay style, which is going to be equal to, and then we can increase the Z index to something like 999 to ensure that it appears on top. And for now, let's simply make this pop over return a word of test. Now, if we go back and if we go back to header, we can now use this current user right within our header. Current user coming from dot slash current user, and we can call it like a self-closing component. Now, the question is, how are we going to show this header on our page? To do that, we're going to make it a part of the layout. Why? Because we don't want to explicitly mention the header on each and every page. We just want to ensure that it's a part of all the pages. So let's create the index file of all of our layout components by creating a new index.tsx within the layout folder. There we can run RAFCE again to get a simple React application, which we can call layout. Make sure to export it that way as well. Layout right here. Now within here, we can use something known as a themed layout v2. Yep, it's a component called themed layout v2. And we can import it automatically from at refine dev forward slash and d. The reason why we're importing it is because it's accepting a prop called header to which we can pass our header component, which is coming from dot slash header. Great. Now within this themed layout v2, we also need to pass our children as in everything or any page that is going to be there will show and it will be wrapped by our themed layout. That's what the layout is for. And then we can get the children, of course, as a part of the react props right here. And since we're using TypeScript, we can also define the type for it, such as react dot props with children. There we go. Alongside the header, we can also provide a title. So we can say title is equal to, and we can make it a callback function where we automatically get title props as its first parameter. 
there, we can then return a themed title, v2, which is going to be a self-closing component, inside of which we're going to spread the title props, and we're going to pass the text equal to, we can do something like refine in this case, or later on, we can modify it to the name of our dashboard. And this is it for our layout. So now, let's figure out how we can use it. Now, we can use this layout within the app.tsx by going right here below all of our auth routes and creating a new route. This one won't be self-closing. Instead, it will have an element prop equal to, and then right here within it, we can call the authenticated component coming from refine dev core. This abstracts the login functionality for us and it automatically tells us if we're authenticated or not. So we can call it as a self-closing component and we of course have to import it and to it, we can pass a key. This key makes sure that this authenticated component is unique and we can do something like authenticated dash layout and fallback is very important here. So what's going to happen if we're not logged in? In this case, the fallback will be the catch all navigate coming from refine react router v6. And we simply want to make that a self-closing component that will navigate to forward slash login. So now if we're not authenticated, we simply go there. But if we are authenticated, then we can wrap everything in the layout component we created coming from dot slash components forward slash layout. And within it, we want to create a new component called outlet. Now outlet is not a component that we'll create. Rather, it's a component coming directly from react router DOM. It's a special component that renders the child route of the current route, meaning that any route that is a child of the current route will be rendered inside of the outlet. In this case, the home page is a child of the authenticated route. So it will be rendered inside of the outlet. And if you remember correctly, the layout is using the header. So right here, we should be able to see the header. If we reload, you can see that we have some issues right now, even though we're on localhost 5173. So if we open up the terminal, we don't have any errors there. And right here in the browser, we can see that layout is not a route component. All children of routes must be a route or react fragment. Interesting. Let's see, we have a layout and then we have outlet. Uh, and outlet has been imported from react router DOM and layout is coming from components layout. Hmm. Why could that be? Well, if I go here, I can notice that we should have wrapped all of these components within the authenticated element. And right now it's kind of being a self closing element right here. So just to better see this, I'm going to put this on a new line and I won't immediately close it. Rather, I will make it a regular element. And then now we have to put the layout within this authenticated. So let's put it right here, nested within it. So keep in mind, if we're not authenticated, we fall back to catch all navigate to login, else we show a layout rendering all the children element. And then we close the authenticated right here. Finally, we're missing the close of the element. So let's close it right here. And then we need to close the actual route element as well. And within the route, we want to show the home. So we can now delete this welcome page as we don't need it anymore. And instead, we can move this route index home into these routes right here, or rather into the initial route where we have all of the other routes with the outlet and the layout. So now if we save this, you can see that now we have a test, which is our header. And then we have our home as well as the mobile sidebar. If we click it, this looks good right off the bat. So now that we can actually see our layout, why don't we go into it and then go into the header. And now that we can visually see it, let's turn it into a real header. This is how that header will look like on the deployed application. It's just a circular avatar photo. And then once you click on it, you can see a pop over or a pop-up that we have been talking about, which your full name and a link pointing to account settings.
So let's create it. And then automatically, since we're using it in the layout, it will be reused across all of these other pages. First, we can go into the current user. We have our pop over. And instead of showing test, we can show a real custom avatar. So let's go ahead and create a new component within the components folder by creating a new file called custom dash avatar dot TSX. Keep in mind, this is not in the layout, just within the components folder. Run RAFCE to quickly spin up a new component. And let's call it something like custom avatar. But of course, in Pascal case, meaning that every first word is capitalized. Within here, we're going to simply use the ant D avatar. So instead of a div, we can use the ant D avatar like this, which we can import from ant design by saying import instead of curly braces avatar as ant D avatar coming from ant D. And then within it, we can put the name initials of this person. In this case, I'm going to do J M for JavaScript mastery. Now, why does our header still say test? Well, that's because we haven't yet used this custom avatar component within it. So here we can use a custom avatar, which we can import from dada slash custom dash avatar and call it as a self closing component. And there we go. You can immediately see this JM on top left. Now let's style it a bit. Let's give it a couple of props, such as the alt tag of the actual name of this person. And all of these properties will be coming through props. But for now, let's simply call it John Doe. Or since we use JavaScript mastery, we can use JavaScript mastery here as well. Next, let's also provide the size equal to small. And let's provide some additional styling. Style is equal to and we can provide a background color. So let's do background color of let's do this caller that chat GPT automatically recommends 87D068. There we go. We have to properly close it and save it. There we go. That's looking good to me. Now alongside the background caller, we can also give it some additional properties. In this case, we can give it display equal to flex. We can also give it the align items equal to center. And we can give it a border equal to none. Now it's possible that we're going to pass some additional props or some additional styles as props to this custom avatar component. So let's immediately grab them right here through props. We can destructure them and get a name. We can also get style and we can spread the rest of the props like so, and we can add type of props. In this case, we can define this type props equal to avatar props, which are going to be coming from and D and we can add our own, which is going to be name of type string. There we go. Now we have our props and we can actually use a real name, which we can pass through props. So now we're calling it, but let's go ahead and pass it as well into this custom avatar component to be able to pass these things for the first time ever, we're going to use our odd provider or rather a function we have created in there. Use get identity. So we can say const data, which we can rename as user is equal to use get identity coming from refine dev core. What this hook is doing is it's actually getting our own function that we created and hooked up to our auth. And we can see that if we go to our auth provider, there we go. We have our get identity, which gets the user information. And what this refine core hook does, it simply allows us to use it and provides everything we requested or specified right here. So now we know exactly what we're going to come back. Not only that we know what we're going to get back, but TypeScript also knows, which is the beauty of refine and GraphQL. Uh, so let's define the type right here as user. We can do it within these kinds of brackets. And this user will be coming from GraphQL schemas. So this is the first time that we're using a GraphQL schema. So let's import it at the top. Import type user is coming from add forward slash GraphQL forward slash schema dot types. Now, this is the first time that we're using the reference to a specific path. 
using the add forward slash. And I don't think we have fully set it up yet, even though we have installed the packages needed to run it. So what we can do to make it work is we can go to our vite.config.ts and we have to put our plugin to use. So right here, we can import tsconfig paths from vite.config paths like so. And then we can add it as the first plugin right here by calling it like a function. On top of that, we also have to open the tsconfig.json right at the end after JSX, we also need to add a comma and then say base URL is going to be dot a string of dot slash SRC. So we know that everything is starting from the source. And then we can also add paths. And those paths are going to look like this. It's an object inside of which we have add forward slash and then asterisk, which means everything. And then we can make this an array of dot slash everything. So this is simply a way for us to let the tsconfig know how we want to refer to specific files without saying dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash and moving all the way to the source. So this is now good. And if we go back, we should now be able to use this GraphQL schema we should now be able to refer to this file directly through references. Let's just reload the terminal just to be sure by running npm run dev one more time and reload it. And it does seem like our page is active right here. We don't have any errors, but we do have one error. If we hover over the GraphQL schema types, it says that it cannot find that module. That's because if you try to control or command click this file, you'll notice that it doesn't actually exist we haven't yet generated it. We haven't written the types manually, nor we have created a system that would automate creating the types for us based off of GraphQL schemas. So first let's set up a GraphQL config, and then we're going to tell it how to create those types. We can do that by creating a new file in the root of our directory called graphql.config.ts. In the readme down below, you'll be able to find a full GraphQL config. So simply copy it and paste it right here. There's a lot of comments. I really try to do my best to explain everything that is happening here, but still let's go through that together. First, we specify a config, which we import from GraphQL config. This is just the type for the config itself. We have to define the GraphQL schema provided by refine, and then we add a couple of extensions. And then the most important one here is CodeGen, which is a plugin that generates TypeScript types from GraphQL schemas for us automatically. We can also add a couple of hooks, which are being executed after a specific action. And then we want to say, what do we generate? And here you can see the reference of the file we were trying to use within our current user, the GraphQL schema types, which are going to be generated really soon. And then we add the preset, the documents. This is mostly template that we're following with every single GraphQL config. Now that we have this, we also have to modify our package.json file by adding an additional script. So let's navigate over to package.json. And by the way, to open this little window, which is very useful, you just press control or command P, and then you're able to start typing the name of the file you want to go to and simply press enter and it's much quicker than opening up the Explorer. Once you're here, we can go to the scripts part of our package.json. There, we can add a new script called CodeGen, like this. And it's going to call a command GraphQL-CodeGen. There we go. So believe it or not, CodeGen will automatically generate all of the types for us. It's kind of like having all of the benefits of TypeScript without it doing all of the dirty work, which is actually writing TypeScript types and interfaces. Cool, right? So let's see how we can put this into action. We can open up our terminal and while keeping the first one running, we can now run npm run codegen and press enter. You can see it's going to run GraphQL codegen and it will parse configurations and generate outputs. It looks like it loaded the GraphQL schemas correctly, but it was unable to find any GraphQL source files. The reason we got this error is because we haven't yet created any GraphQL mutations or queries. 
So let's create a new folder in the root of our directory called GraphQL. And let's create a new file called mutations.ts as well as queries.ts. Now throughout our entire application, we're going to have a lot of queries and a lot of mutations working with a lot of different pieces of data. These queries are very specific. They go through sorting, pagination, filtering, and just contain a lot of stuff to write, but aren't very complicated to understand. So what I would like to do in this video is provide you with a complete queries.ts file, which you can find in the readme down below, copy it, and then paste it right here. Don't be scared. I see that it is 250 lines long, but once we visit a specific part of the application that uses one of these queries, we're going to come back to it. And then I'm going to explain in detail, how does it work? For example, this dashboard total counts query, which queries the dashboard total counts and returns the total count for companies, contacts, and deal. I'm going to explain every single one of these queries once we actually use them within the application. Now let's repeat the same thing for mutations as well. You'll be able to find full mutations, which you can copy and then paste right here. We're going to come back to this later. Now that we have both of our mutations queries, as well as the GraphQL config, we are able to rerun this command, which will automatically generate all the types for us. But before I do that, there's one small thing I want to tell you. And that is that there is a special GraphQL extension right here, which provides syntax highlighting for GraphQL files. So if you install it and then go to something like queries and nothing because it's still a template string, I think we might need another GraphQL LSP extension. So GraphQL language support, let's install it. It must have 1.8 million downloads for a reason, right? And now that we do this, you can see that it's no longer a string, even though it is within a template string, but this extension really nicely reads the query as well as all of the objects and filtering functions and everything else within the query itself. So this is now very good and it's going to help us later on. But with that said, let's open up the terminal and let's rerun the npm run code gen command. And still we have the same error. Let's try to debug it. Uh, it says unable to find any GraphQL files in source something and then TS files. If you look into our queries, it indeed is a .ts file, but it's within the GraphQL folder, which is not within the source. And it's specifically looking for GraphQL files within the source. So we simply have to move this GraphQL folder within the source folder. There we go. I always like to include this little bugs because you could spend hours debugging them and they happen to everybody, but it's just a matter of how you're going to approach actually solving them. So now that we have done this, um, I can try to rerun this command for hopefully third and last time. There we go. Parse configurations and generate outputs. Now, if we go back to this same GraphQL folder, we can see two additional things have been created for us schema.types.ts, which looks like some witchcraft right here, uh, TypeScript witchcraft. Uh, but we do have something here. We have a lot of different things that we might want to use across our application uh, for, for all of our objects and for all of our documents we'll be using. Companies, yeah, it's really anything. Uh, and all of this has been generated for us automatically by CodeGen since we're using GraphQL and since we're using TypeScript. We also have a bit of a simpler to understand file, which is the types.ts. And here we have any types that we might want to use. For example, type for the update company mutation, where we know exactly what we want for a specific company. We also have, I believe, the user. So if we search for user, we can search for a capital user like so. And if we scroll a bit here, we should be able to find our user type. No, it doesn't seem to be here. But if we go into the schema types and search for user here, there we go, we have created by user. And there we go, we have our export type user, which has all of the properties we might ever need on the user object. So going all the way back to where we were, 
Keep in mind, I know this is taking a lot of time, but we're doing the groundwork, we're doing the setup for the project, which is going to significantly help us in future development of this application. Keep in mind, all of this started since we imported this add forward slash GraphQL schema types. First, we had to fix our references to specific files, and then we had to actually import the user type, which now that I think about it, I was searching for it all across those files, but TypeScript is so wonderful because now we can immediately hover over it and we can see exactly which properties does this user have. Not even that, we can try using this user by saying user.name and it automatically knows what this user property has. We can also search for something like, there we go. Take a look at this. This reminds me of my university days in computer science when I was using Java. Java had such a wonderful IntelliSense system and it lets you know everything, all the methods, all the properties that a specific object has. And this is exactly how it feels like. I can literally see what my user object has and heck, it even adds a question mark for me because it knows that the ID could potentially be undefined. And if I type something like something right here, it's going to let me know, no, something definitely doesn't exist on the type user. So it took us some time, but trust me, it's more than worth it. And it's going to save us from making so many mistakes in the future. So all of this started by trying to provide additional props to this custom avatar, which we now can do by going right here and then giving it a name prop of user question mark dot name, or even if I type name, I think it automatically does it. There we go. We also can provide a source, which is the profile photo, which is the avatar URL. And then we can also provide the size of default and a style of cursor dash pointer. Now we're providing these properties. We can go into the custom avatar. We can say that the name is optional because sometimes it's not going to be there. We can spread all of the existing styles right here, dot, dot, dot style in case we want to make some modifications. And we can also spread the rest of the properties outside of the styles right here by using this syntax. Now we have the actual profile photo because it applies the avatar URL. We can also use the name here in the alt and you cannot see it right now, but if we don't have the profile photo, then we need some name initials because JavaScript mastery is definitely way too much to fit this. So we can develop a custom get initials function. To create this utility function, we can first create a new folder called utils, often known as utility functions or simply said functions that we can reuse across our entire application, just helper functions. Since we'll have quite a few throughout the entire build of this application, and since mostly the utility functions are now being created by ChatGPT because they're just so generic, which means that ChatGPT can generate it, I generated a couple of these using ChatGPT and I provided them to you right in the description down below in that same readme file. You'll find a zipped utilities folder, download it, unzip it, and then paste it right here within the source folder. It's going to look something like this. Utilities, where we have some date utilities, currency numbers, get name initials, get random colors, stuff like that, right? But specifically, we're working with the get initials now, which simply takes a name, splits it, maps over it, and then you end up having just not JavaScript mastery. But let's see what do you get if we go here and we call get name initials. Now we can see how this automatically works. I just press control space and it recommended me the reference to this import add forward slash utilities, and we can pass our name. And it's complaining a bit here, saying that the name possibly is not a string. So we can also here say, or an empty string. There we go. Now, if I save it, you can see MS for mastery, as in JavaScript mastery. That's great. And why did I mention ChatGPT? Because nowadays, this is basically the one thing that it's phenomenally good at. You can basically create a comment saying something like create a function that gets initials from a name. And then you can use GitHub Copilot and it's going to do it for you right here. Or you can use ChatGPT and then just paste the function. It's perfect for these simple use cases. But trust me, it's not going to replace you as a developer 
for a couple of decades. So I don't want to see those comments, is AI replacing all of us soon? No, it's not, but it's just there to help you. And there we go. Now we have the get initials, but I will also bring back this rest operator because now we have a photo. There we go. Not looking good so far, but it will look better soon. Now that we have this custom avatar, let's get back to the current user and let's figure out what happens once we click on this custom avatar. We have to create the content for the popover. To do the content for the popover, we can create a new variable, const content is equal to, and it's just going to be a div. Yes, you can define elements like this and then use them within your JSX later on. And we can give this div a style property of display is equal to flex, as well as flex direction is equal to column. We're using CSS and JS right here. Within this div, we're going to use a text component. So let's first create it. We can create it within the components folder. It's going to be called text.tsx. And this text is exactly what it says to be text. So in the readme down below, you can find the text.tsx component, copy it, and then paste it right here. You can see that it seems like it has a lot of lines, but basically we're defining different sizes right here. So we're making our app extensible for future use. Whenever you want to have small or extra small or extra large text, this automatically applies different font sizes and line heights to it. So it's just so much easier to use. Now, if we close that and go back, we can now use this text element, which is coming from dot dot slash text. And to it, we can pass a couple of props. We can pass a prop of strong as well as additional style properties of padding 12 pixels on top and bottom and 20 pixels on left and right. Within it, we can render the user's name. So user question mark dot name. Then we can go a bit below the text and create a new div element. Within this div, we're going to render a button. And that button is going to have a style property of text align, which is going to be set to left. It's also going to have an icon, which is going to be equal to setting outlined icon coming from and design icons. We can self close it right here. It's going to have a type of text as well as a block property. And on click, we want to modify one of the states in our application. It's going to be a state of set is open. Um, and then we're going to simply set it to true right here. Of course, this state doesn't yet exist. So we can add it right here at the top by using the use state snippet is open and set is open. There we go like this. And we need to import use state coming from react. And at the start, it's going to be set to false. So now we're setting it to open. And this button will therefore say something like account settings. So this is going to open up a completely new modal. So let's see if we click it, nothing happens yet because we're never using this content, right? So what we can do is we can now use this content and add it as a prop to the pop over content is equal to content we have just created. So now once you click on it, you can see Michael Scott and you can see account settings. We can also provide some additional styling for this div wrapping the button. We can give it a style equal to border top of one pixel solid hash D nine D nine D nine. We can also give it some padding of four pixels. Let's give it a display of flex as well. We can give it a flex direction so that it shows in a column and a gap of about four pixels to make some space. There we go. That's a bit better. So now we have this account settings. You can open it. You can close it as well. That is our pop over. And then here we're going to have some account settings right now. We're never looking into this is open. So let's actually put it to use right here below our pop over. We can then display a new component depending on the open state, but we only want to do it if we have a currently logged in user. So we can say user and end a component called account settings. There we go. It's going to be a self-closing account settings model. 
we can even display it like this so it's a bit easier to see what's happening. There we go. Now, let me show you how this account settings model looks like. If I click on it here in our deployed application, it just pulls this model right here where you have a photo, you have a name, email, job title, and a phone number, and you can save it if you want to. This is all it is. So let's go to our components, layout, and create a new file called account-settings.tsx. And in the same readme you found all of the other code, you'll also be able to find the complete account settings component. Simply copy it and paste it. The reason why I wanted you to copy and paste it is because it's a lot of JSX. Uh, we're using a drawer component here and some cards with forms, but essentially it's just a couple of inputs and a photo and a save button. That's it. And all of the refine actions here have been very heavily documented. So you can see exactly how we're doing the update action. That's it. You can see we're also using the custom avatar from here, but it doesn't seem to be imported from the correct path. So I think we used it as a default export. So here we can remove those two and now it's looking good. Great. And now you can notice that we need to pass three different props to the account settings. Opened, set opened, and user ID. So let's do that. Opened is going to be equal to our is open. Set opened is going to be equal to our set is open. And then finally we pass the user right here. And then we import account settings from dot slash account settings. You can press control space to automatically get this import. It's complaining a bit about the user saying that it's not assignable right here. And that's because we don't need to pass the entire user, just the user ID. So if we say user ID is equal to user dot ID, we should be good. Once again, TypeScript saved us right here. So now if I click on the account avatar and then account settings, we have this nice looking drawer that comes from the right side of the screen. On desktop devices, it's gonna look something like this. Looks great as well. Now let's finalize our header because this is not looking good. It's just stuck in the top left corner of the screen. This is how it should look like. So let's close our current user. And finally, now that our current user is completely done, we can focus on finalizing the header component. The header is going to use a couple of components from add design. We're going to wrap everything with a layout dot header component. And this layout is coming from add D so we can automatically import it. Then we wrap the current user but we also want to provide it some space. So we can use a space component also coming from and D and then put the current user right within it. This space can have a property of align is equal to center and size is equal to middle. And to the header, we need to provide some custom styling. So let's say style is equal to header styles. And then we can define them right here. Const header styles is equal to, and we can define a background color to start with, such as FFF, and that's good. There we go, it's actually white now. We can give it a display equal to flex to make it a flex container. We can give it a justify content of flex dash end to move it at the end of the screen. We can give it align items of center, so now it's vertically centered. We can also give it some padding like zero on top and bottom and 24 on left and right. We can give it a position equal to sticky. So it's actually going to stick to the top. We can give it top zero then so it knows where to stick and a Z index of 999. Now this style is going to complain that it's not really a style. So we have to let it know that this object indeed does contain the styles. So we can define the type of react dot CSS properties, and we can save it right here. There we go. So now it's looking good. It doesn't complain. And we have our header inside of which we have our account and then account settings right here. Finally, the header is done and we cannot see the home, but yeah, we are in the home right here. You can see it just barely behind this sidebar thingy. So now we have the home page. This is the home we're seeing. And we can focus on adding some of the other routes as well. Later on, we're going to have companies, tasks, and logout. But for now, let's just focus on adding all of these links to our sidebar. 
and then we can nicely navigate between them. And to do that in Refine, we have a special resources config file that we have to create. So let's go to our source and then create a new folder called config. And then within config, create a new file called resources.tsx. Inside of here, we can export const resources, which is going to be of a type i resource item, which is coming from refine dev core. And we want to have an array of these right here, which is going to be an array. Now these resources are going to be path definitions that are going to help refine recognize the available actions for all of our resources at specific paths. There is a great documentation page on refine that it explains this in a more detailed way. But in short, Actions are basically the paths that you can use to perform CRUD operations on a specific resource. It's like grouping the CRUD operations under a single name. So it's going to look something like this. I'm going to add this comment right here. A resource in Refine performs these actions. List, which gets all records or reads. Show, which gets a single record, also read. And then create, edit, and delete, or clone. So let me show you how that would look like. First, we can create an object within this array with a name of dashboard. Then we can also add a list right here, which is going to be just forward slash. We can also provide something known as a meta, which is used to store any additional information about the resource, anything you want. In this case, we can put it as an object with a label with a dashboard of uppercase D. And we can also give it an icon which is going to be a self-closing dashboard outlined icon, which we can automatically import from add design icons. And now we can provide commas as well to nicely close. And let's not forget to close it. There we go. So this is our first resource. So now the question is, where are we going to make use of these resources? Let's go to app.tsx as that is where our primary refine wrapper is. Right below the auth provider, we can provide resources is equal to, and then we pass the same resources, which we import from config resources. In the context of CRUD applications, a resource typically refers to a data entity that can be created, read, updated, or deleted. And in this case, dashboard is one of these, and it automatically shows it. The dashboard in this case is our home. But now if we go further into resources, it's going to start making more sense because the second resource is going to be companies. So let's go right here, create a new object with a name of companies with a list of forward slash companies as well. Show. And here you can provide the route to show. And do you know what a show is? Show is to show a specific company, just a single document. So that's companies ID. We can also create. So the route for create, which is companies, let's do new in this case. And we can also do edit, which is going to be companies ID or edit, or in this case, I think it's better to do edit and then forward slash the ID, which we want to edit. We can also provide the additional meta information, such as the label of capitalized companies. And then we can do something like shop outlined, and we can import this icon from add design icons. And we can duplicate this object one more time below and we can do everything the same, but this time for the tasks. So we can say tasks forward slash tasks, show task ID. We won't have the show as we'll only be showing multiple tasks, create, which is going to be tasks, new tasks, edit, and then meta, which is going to be tasks. And we can also provide the icon of project outlined, which we can import right here from add design icons. And now we have all of our resources, which we're importing and using within this refine wrapper. And you can see how immediately they are now showing up right here on our sidebar as well. And the routing has been automatically created for us too. And if we go to companies or tasks right now, you can see that we will be redirected, but nothing will be shown on the screen. That's because we of course haven't yet created the route for that specific path or created a page that will be shown on there for that matter. So we'll do that soon, but the routing works. And soon enough, all of our pages are going to look like this, 
we're going to have companies, which is going to be a complete dashboard of all of the companies. Of course, it looks much better on larger devices where we have a completely responsive dashboard design where you can search by specific company titles. We also have the actions such as edit that opens up this complete form. And then you can also see the contacts belonging to that specific company. And you can, of course, delete them. And let's not forget the create. There we go. Then there's also the tasks, which is a complete Kanban board, which we're going to also develop from scratch where you can add new cards. And then you can also add card details, which is very similar to something like Trello or even Jira. There we go. And you can, of course, drag and drop and move everything in real time. So exciting stuff begins now. First, we're going to start with this dashboard that looks amazing on all devices, but dashboards definitely shine on desktop sizes. We're going to have, first of all, these top cards to show some highlighted information, then the upcoming events, deals section, and then the latest activities. So with that said, let's turn this home or just E at the end into something more like this. To get started with the home page, we can navigate to the home route, which is source pages, home, and then index.tsx, where for now we simply say just home. Our home page is going to be wrapped in a div, but then immediately after we want to use an and design property called row, which we can again import from and design. It's not a self-closing property because we need to pass some columns into that row. So let's provide our first call, which is also coming from Add Design, so you can automatically import it. And inside of there, we can show our first component, which is going to be our calendar upcoming events. There we go. So now you can see it here. And then below this column, we're going to show another one. But before we duplicate it, let's provide a couple of props to it first, such as on extra small devices, it's going to take 24 spaces. On small, it's also going to take 24. On extra large, it's going to take eight. And we can also give it a style of height is 460 pixels. In this case, this is just the total number of rows. And what this 24 means is just a total number of columns per row. So here it's going to take the full screen. Here it's going to take about one third of the screen. Great. Now we can duplicate this column entirely. And the second one is going to render the dashboard deals chart. So these are two different components, which we're going to create soon. And this one is also going to have all of the same properties. Now let's also provide some of the props to this row, such as a gutter property of an array of 32 and 32. This is going to provide some spacing as well as a style equal to margin top of 32 pixels. So now we pushed it a bit and we can see how these rows or columns are working on mobile. They're showing one after another. And then if I expand it a bit, you can see then they start showing one next to another. So this functions well. And now we can actually implement these two components. So let's go to components. We can create a new folder within it called home because we're going to put specifically the components for the home page right here. And then we can call this component upcoming dash events dot TSX. And there we can run RAFCE. Whenever you run RAFCE automatically switch this to Pascal case upcoming events. There we go. And let's also implement the second one, which is going to be the deals chart. So new deals dash chart dot TSX. RAFCE, and then modify it to deals chart. Now we can import these two components right within our index. And to import them here, we first have to export them within the components. So let's create a new index.ts file within the components folder. Inside of here, we can import these two new components we have created. Um, so that's going to be import upcoming events from home upcoming events. And we can also have import deals chart from deals chart. And then we can export them like this, export an object containing those. Now, if we go back, we can simply import upcoming events. 
There we go, from add forward slash components as a self-closing component. And then the other one is, let's just see what it was. If we go here and to the index, it was deals chart. So if we go back, we can now do deals chart and get it from components as well. That one index file allowed us to get all of these in a single import. And now we have upcoming events and deals chart, which means that we can now control or command click into the first one, which is the upcoming events, and we can start developing it. Let's first start with the JSX part, which are going to be this single card that's going to show us all of the upcoming events, such as this annual company picnic or cross-department collaboration meeting. I'm sure Michael Scott has quite a few of those. So let's start implementing it. First, we wanna wrap everything in a card. And that is of course an and design card, so we can immediately import it. If we save it, that immediately gets turned into a card. We can also give it a style property of height is set to 100%. There we go, so now it fills out the space. And we can also give it something known as a head style, where we can provide some additional padding of eight pixels on top and bottom, and then 16 pixels on left and right. Alongside the head style, we can also provide something known as a body style. This style right here allows us to also provide a padding to the body. So we can do zero on top and bottom and one rem on left and right. Then we can also provide a title, but this is getting a bit messy. So let's position or indent all of these props into new lines. And then the next prop for our card will be a title. We can say something like upcoming events, and then it gets displayed on the top. So we don't need upcoming events within the card anymore because that's going to be the card body. But in this case, we're gonna style the title a bit more. We're gonna turn it into a complete JSX component. We're gonna wrap it into a div, and that div is going to have a style equal to display is set to flex, align items is set to center, and then also gap is set to eight pixels to give it some spacing. Within this div, we wanna have an icon of calendar outlined, which is coming from add design icons. To automatically import it, I just press enter. And then we also wanna use our own text component. Once again, I'm gonna just press enter on the dot dot slash text to import it. And we can simply say upcoming events right within that text. Of course, we can also give it some props such as size is equal to SM for small and style, give it a margin left of 0.7 rem. And of course this has to be in a string because we're doing CSS in JS. Makes you appreciate the nice utility classes of Tailwind. And right here we have our upcoming events and this is looking very nice. We have a card title. Now the question is what are we gonna show within this card? So first we can also create a loading state because first before we show the data, we'll be loading that data. So let's create a new use state field or use state snippet called is loading, set is loading. At the start, let's set it to true so we can test out the loading state and let's automatically import use state from React. Now we can open up a new ternary block and say if is loading, or rather is loading and then question mark, in that case, we wanna show a list. This is a special component, which we can import from add design or just add D. We can expand that list for now and then say colon, or meaning what's gonna happen if we have loaded the elements. And then we can also render a list. There we go. By default, the list will say no data. So let's try to show at least something. On this first list, we can add a prop of item layout, which is going to be set to horizontal. We can then give it a data source. And usually you would pass a real data coming from the database or an API. But here we can just demo or mock specific data by using the array constructor we're saying array that from length is going to be set to five. We can then map over it by using the dot map where we get the index of a specific property. 
it's the second parameter. So we use just an underscore to signify that we don't need the first one, just the second one. And then we simply automatically return an index within an object. To automatically return, you have to wrap the output inside of parentheses. So first parentheses, and then an object. Usually it will just be a function block where the ID is set to index. So we're essentially mocking a couple of elements to show right here. And I don't think I'm closing it properly. We need one more parenthesis. There we go. So now it's kind of like showing something, but nothing is there yet. And while we are rendering the items, we might want to show some loading states or also sometimes known as skeletons. I'm sure you've seen them everywhere on the web. Here are a couple of examples. I believe this one is for LinkedIn and this is a mobile version, Medium, Facebook. When you don't have the data or when the connection is not as good, you want to show something to the user. And that something is in most cases just a gray rectangle that's slowly pulsating, saying that something is going to come here and fill that space out. So let's create this skeleton. And we're going to have skeletons for all different kinds of components in our application. So first, let's create the skeleton for the upcoming events. This skeleton is going to be within our components. So that's right here. And then we can create a new folder called skeleton. Within that skeleton, we can create a new file called upcoming dash events dot TSX. And this skeleton is basically nothing else than a simple react component. Here is how it looks like you basically render what you usually would, but then and design provides a special component called skeleton, which you basically just put where you would usually put your content in this case as a button within the list item. And then it shows those gray rectangles. Now, since we're going to have a couple of these skeletons, and since you wouldn't really learn anything by me having you to type them out, I'm going to provide you the full folder of these skeletons. So delete the folder you have created right now and just find the zipped skeletons folder below, download it, unzip it and paste it right here within your components folder. As you can see, we have a couple and one of these is upcoming events. Before we use these skeletons, we also have to export them. So in our index.ts file, we can quickly do that by simply importing and then exporting some of these components. That's going to be upcoming events. But I think we should call it a skeleton right here. Yep, upcoming events skeleton. So we can say upcoming events skeleton. And unfortunately, it doesn't give me the auto import. So we can do it manually by saying import upcoming events skeleton from dot slash skeleton forward slash upcoming events skeleton. No, that's not it. I think we just called it upcoming events because we have the folder right here indicating that it's a skeleton. There we go. That's good. And we also need to repeat this for the four other ones. Let's see which other ones do we have as well. That's going to be the accordion header. So let's import accordion header skeleton. There we go. Now it's doing a bit better. Let's also import something like a Kanban column skeleton. That's better. And let's also import the project card skeleton. There we go. And I do believe that's it. We have one, two, three, four. Now we're missing one. We have the latest activities. So let's import latest activities skeleton. And now we can just in new lines, put all of these new skeletons. Let's do just that. There we go. We can even divide them with one empty line and then say upcoming events, accordion header, Kanban column, project card, and then latest activities skeleton. And what this now allows us to do is go back to where we were in the upcoming events. And then here we can provide an additional prop called render item where we can have a callback function that's going to render the upcoming events skeleton. And now we do get this automatic import from the skeleton folder. There we go. And we can just self close it. Now, if we do this, we need to provide something in the list as well. Or in this case, we don't, we can just self close it. And of course, I have to close this render item as well. So now you can see how nicely it's loading for our five imaginary data source items, one, two, three, four, five. And we can see this nice animating skeletons. But as soon as I switch this 
is loading to false, which is how it should be, there's no data because now it's our job to do the second list, the list that happens once we actually have the data. So some of these things are going to be similar. First of all, of course, the item layout. Item layout is also going to be horizontal. We don't want to change that. The data source is going to be completely different because now we actually want to fetch real data. So for now, I'm just going to simply put it as an empty array, but soon enough, we're going to provide some real data sources. And we can also provide the render item, which means for each one of these array items, what are we going to show or render? So let's get the item itself. And then in the callback function, we can open up a new function block and then just return something. In this case, for each one, for each item, we want to return a list dot item, all uppercase like this. And this list we have already imported from and D. Within this list item, we also want to render a list dot item dot meta, which is going to be a self closing component to which we can provide a couple of props. We can provide the avatar, which is going to render some kind of a badge with a specific color. So in this case, we can render a badge element, which we can import from and D and it's going to have a color equal to item dot color. So we're going to get it directly from this item we're trying to render. Now our TypeScript is complaining because we don't have a color on an empty array or on nothing that's within the array. But soon enough, we're going to fetch real data sources for our upcoming events. So we'll be able to display something. Before that, let's just finalize what we want to see within each list item. We definitely want to have some kind of a title, which we can wrap within our text container or our text component. So let's just wrap it text and let's give it a size equal to XS for extra small. And let's just render the render date. And within it, let's try to render the date of when this event is happening. Usually dates are just in plain JavaScript objects. So we have to actually render it in a human readable format. To do that, we can do it right here at the top by saying const render date is equal to get date, which is a utility helper function, which we can import. And to it, we can pass the item dot start date, as well as the item dot end date. And it's automatically going to generate it in a human readable format. Again, for now, just ignore these TypeScript warnings. As soon as we get the real data, it's going to exist on the item. So it will render it properly. And now within the title, we can simply render the render date. Below the title, we can also render the description, which is going to be yet another text element. And this text is going to have an ellipsis property. Ellipsis is those three dots when the text is too long to fit in the container. And we want to turn on the tooltip to be true. So once we hover over it, we'll be able to see the full thing. And we also want to make it strong so we can give it a strong prop. It's just the bolded text. And there we can render the item dot title. I believe this is it. This is everything we want to render within our list item. Now, if we save it once again, nothing is happening. And that's because we're not yet fetching any data, which is exactly what we're going to do now. We have to figure out how we can populate this data source. And boy, does Refine make it easy. Now we'll finally start making use of all of the groundwork we've done. We've laid out the foundations, which now allow us to use all of those resources. Remember the config or the resources we've created right here? One of these was tasks, companies, and dashboard. Now we'll be able to just consume some of these resources and just make CRUD operations on them. Specifically here for the config, we listed the ones that we want to show on the sidebar, such as companies, tasks, and so on. But in this case, we'll be using the resource of events. So let me show you how we can get access to all of these events and then display them right here. At the top of our upcoming events, we can say const and then destructure the data and the is loading state, which we can rename to events loading. And that's going to be equal to a cook call of use list, which is coming from refine dev core. It's a function. It's a hook specifically. And we have to pass an object to it inside of which we define 
which list do we want to use and exactly what kind of data do we want to get back? Let me show you how it works. Here, you can say resource and you can provide the name of the resource you want to fetch. In this case, we want to get events. There we go. Now, if we save this, let's try to see what happens. Now, as you can see, this temporarily broke our app, but that's good. And I'm happy that it did. It gave us some time to fully figure out what exactly use list is and just how powerful it is. Use list is a hook created by Refine that allows you to fetch data from your API. Within their docs, we can see that it is an extended version of the Tanstacks queries use query that supports all of its features and then adds some more. When you need to fetch data, you can do it automatically. You can do sorting, filtering, pagination, everything from a specific resource. It uses the getList method as query function from the data provider, which is passed to the refine component. It also caches the data and does a lot of exciting stuff as well. And here's an example of how we can use it, similarly to what we have done right now. You simply get the data, the loading, the error, and define the resource. But in our case, we're using GraphQL, and we have to add a specific GraphQL query as a meta field to this use list hook. So let's add it right here. Meta, which is going to be an object where we can provide the GQL query in this case, because we're doing a fetch. And here we can do dashboard, all uppercase, dashboard underscore calendar, underscore upcoming events, underscore query which we can automatically import from queries. Now, if we get back, everything seems to be working. No more errors. Now we're providing the use list everything that it needs. But as I promised, let's now dive into this GQL query and look exactly what it does. This one is of a medium size. We're doing a query on the upcoming events, and we're also passing some variables. In GraphQL, you can pass some variables such as filters, sorting, and paging, and then we can use those to filter out the documents we want to get back. So here we're saying, give me the events, but apply a filter, apply sorting, apply paging, return the total count, as well as all the nodes, and then the nodes, which are the actual events, may contain these fields. We just passed this GQL query here in meta, we define the resource as events, and the use list will do the rest. Let's see if we're immediately getting something back within the data. So I'm going to console.log data, or just so we don't have to open up the console, let me just alert that. So I'm going to write alert and then pass the data right here, or maybe json.stringify data. That's going to be better. And there we go. You can see it right here. We get back the data with the ID, title, color, start date, end date, and that's it. And we get many of these events back, which means that this is working we have a fully functional mock database that was created for us by Refine that allows us to test this dashboard. And of course, this might as well be your own fully functional database that you will create. It can be an SQL or non-SQL database. You can use Prisma. You can also use Mongoose. The thing is, Refine's hooks and functionalities allow you to very easily consume all that data within your application with the concepts of resources and lists. So you simply define the resource, you can define the meta version in this case of how you're fetching it using GraphQL from the database, and then you simply get it back. That's it. But now if we're getting back the data, why does it still say no data? Well, if you remember, we didn't yet properly pass it over to the list. So here in the data source, we can now say data question mark dot data or simply an empty array if nothing is there. If we now save it, you can see all of these events get populated right here. But hey, we have just a few too many. They jump out of the card. So let's figure out how to do some filtering or maybe even better pagination. Yep, you can implement pagination with just a single line. Pagination, page size is going to be set to something like five and you save it. Automatically, Refine's use list hook will recall this GQL query to which we're now passing the updated page size, which is going to implement pagination on our resources. 
This is the power of Refine and using GraphQL as well as TypeScript to provide comprehensive and scalable environment for developing medium to large applications. This is where Refine really shines. Now that we're nicely getting these elements, let me also show you how to sort them by start date. We can do sorters, and then we can also do an array, and then provide a specific sort, such as field is the start date, and order is ascending. So if we do that, they're gonna be sorted by start date. We can also apply some filters, which is going to be an array of filters. And in this case, let's say we wanna filter by field, which is start date. And we can apply an operator, which is going to be GTE. Uh, it's not a game, GTA, no, it's going to be greater than, that's what it is. And then we can also apply a value, which is going to be a specific date. But in this case, we can make use of the day.js library. So we can say day.js and call it as a function and then use the dot format where you can provide your specific date format. In this case, it's going to be y, 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 mm, and then dd. And of course, day.js is a package which we have to install. It's a fast two kilobyte alternative to moment.js with the same modern API. You just call it and you get some date functionalities. So to get started, you first have to, of course, install it by running npm install day.js. So I'm gonna open up our terminal, split it up, and then simply run npm install day.js. And in a moment, it should automatically be installed. And then we can import it from day.js. So now we're getting the elements as well as applying pagination, sorting, and filtering. It is as easy as that. Now let's go right here below. We have a list, right? And we can also figure out what happens if we finish the loading, but we don't have any elements to show. We can do that right here below the return by opening a new block and say, if not is loading and data question mark dot data dot length is equal to zero, then we can show a new block of code. It's simply going to be a span that's going to say no upcoming events. And we can also apply some styles such as style, display of flex. We can also give it a justify content of center, align items of center, and a height of about, let's do 220 pixels. So it's nicely centered. And let's see why is it complaining right here. We're properly closing it. We're closing it right here. Yeah, this is looking good, but apparently we're not closing something else up. Oh yeah, I think this should go right here below, not within the list, because this is not a list item. It should go above the card right here. There we go. Of course, we won't be able to see it now, but if the data was empty, we should be able to see it. Also, there's nothing in the list, so we can simply self-close it because it's getting the data and rendering the list items. And believe it or not, that is it. And if I scroll up, I can see that I'm only using the is loading, but not set is loading. And that's because I thought that I need to have my own state, but with Refine's use list, you don't even have to create your own state. It automatically exposes the is loading and error properties. So you can immediately use them out of the box and you don't have to modify them and change them later on. Refine's use list does it for you. And there we go. Believe it or not, that is it for the upcoming events. We have not only created this component, but for the first time ever, we have consumed the data from this mock database that was provided for us by Refine, and we were able to play with it and test it out. This is how it looks like on larger devices. It takes just one third of the screen, I think, and still looks great. Of course, this was only querying, no full CRUD operations yet, but we're gonna see that very soon. For now, the most important part for me is that you understood how we can use the use list hook to get a specific resource, in this case events, and automatically apply pagination, sorting and filtering, and most importantly, how we're utilizing the meta property to apply a specific GQL query, GraphQL query, to this use list so it knows exactly what it has to fetch in this case, the upcoming events. Great. 
With that said, the upcoming events is now done and we are ready to focus on the deals chart. This is another component that looks something like this. It is a complete chart which expands and you can see it's fully responsive. We have multiple and you can even turn off or on specific properties, even see details. This is gonna be great. The only thing you have to do is feed it the data and it will automatically display it visually. So let's focus on the deals. And then later, we're gonna focus on these highlighted numbers at the top. So now let's collapse it one more time. Of course, has to look good on mobile as well, which it does right now for the events. And let's focus on the deals chart. To get started with the deals chart, we can first wrap everything in a card similar to what we have done with the upcoming events. This card will of course be coming from add design and we're gonna give it a couple of properties, such as a style property. And here we can define the height of 100%. If we save it, immediately you can notice how these deals turned into an empty card. Next, we can also define a title property right here. And that's going to be a div that's going to have an icon within it called dollars or dollar outlined like so. And we need to import that from dollar outlined and design icons. And we can also define a text element, which we need to import from dot dot slash text. And within it, we can simply say deals. Now we can give it a size equal to small or SM. We can give it a style equal to margin left of about 0.5 rem. There we go, just to divide it a bit from the icon. Now this is looking good both for the upcoming events and for the deals. Let's also style this div just a tiny bit by giving it a style property. Display is going to be flex, align items is going to be center, and then gap is going to be eight, similar to what we have done on the previous card. We can also provide additional head and body styles right here on the card by saying head style, padding of eight on top and bottom and 16 on left and right. And we can also provide a body style that's going to have a padding of something like 24 on top, 24 right, zero on bottom and 24 on the left side. There we go. So this is going to make sense once we actually add the body of the card. Now within the body, we wanna render a new component coming from add design. And this component will be called area. So let's render the area chart and it's going to be a self-closing component that has to have some config information so we can spread the data that config. And we can also define a height, something like 325 should do. Now, creating config is going to be simple, at least to get rid of this error. And we simply need to define a new const config is equal to an empty object. That's it for now. But we haven't yet imported the area from anywhere where do we get access to the area chart? Well, to use charts within and design, we'll have to install the and design plots package, which you can see was updated two days ago, which is always a good sign. And it will give us access to many of these charts. So let's simply install it by running the command npm install add and dash design forward slash plots. But before you press enter, Let's also add a version, add 1.2.5. I found this version to work very well with what we're trying to do. So just to ensure nothing breaks, install this specific version and press enter. As soon as it gets installed, you can then select the area and press control space and automatically import it from and design plots. Now it's still gonna complain saying that the data is missing in the config. So what we have to do is now properly define this config. And the first step in doing that is giving this config a type of area config coming from and design plots. Now we can know exactly what we have to have within this object. You can see we're missing the data property, which is the most important one. So let's figure out how can we get this data property for now we can make it an empty array and that's immediately going to make it work. And we can see a number zero on bottom left, which means that the chart is indeed there and everything is done regarding the JSX part, but now it's our job to figure out how to get and pass the data 
and then maybe modify the chart a bit. So let's work on getting the data first. Once again, we're going to use the use list hook created by Refine that allows us to fetch data from your API. So we can immediately say cons data and then is equal to use list coming from Refine Dev Core. And if you remember correctly, use list is just a wrapper around use query or famously known as 10 stack query as well. We can use it to get the information, sort, filter, paginate, and more. But first things first, we have to provide an options object and then define the resource. In this case, the resource will be deal stages because we want to know about different stages of our deals. Of course, since we're using GraphQL, we also have to provide a meta property right here and then define a GQL or GraphQL query because we're still querying the data. And in this case, it's going to be dashboard underscore deals underscore chart underscore query. And immediately nothing is visible here because we're not using the data yet, but we are no longer seeing an error. And we can even try to console log this data to see what do we get back. And if we do that and inspect the element right here, we can see that we get back an object with six different deal properties, new follow up under review demo and so much more. That's great. It is so easy to get the data now that we have outlined everything. And this is the second time we're using it. You can see how much faster our development process now is now that we have laid down the foundations. And I want to point out here at the start, it might have seemed a bit confusing to use the use list, the resource, the meta. And I want to take a moment to relate to you that at the start, it might have seemed like we're doing too much. We're introducing so much code. And the question was for what? But now I think you can notice it. Now that we have introduced that code, it's so easy to just fetch the data anywhere we need to within any specific file. And that's the beauty of Refine as well as all of the other frameworks. It provides you with a structure that you can then use to your advantage and know that whatever you're doing, you have to do it in the right way. And then the framework has your back. In this case, has your back with GraphQL queries, has your back with TypeScript types and the way that we're fetching back data and error handling as well. So now let's actually put this data to use. We can do that by creating a new function const deal data is equal to, and we're going to use a react.use memo to which we need to pass a callback function and then return a function call of map deals data, which is coming from add forward slash utilities helpers. And then we pass the data question mark dot data to it. This is going to nicely filter out or map our different deals. So they're ready for use in the area chart. Of course, the second parameter of the use memo has to be an array inside of which we can specify when will the use memo have to recompute the memoized values. In this case, only when the data data changes. So why are we using the use memo here? Well, we're using it to memoize the data so that it's not recalculated on every render. And now we can simply pass the deal data right here into the area chart config. This will momentarily break the app, but I believe that's because we have to provide the X field or Y field as well. It's a field that will be used on the X axis and Y axis of the chart. So we can say X field is going to be time text in our case. And the Y field is going to be the value of that deal. So if we save it now, you can see how we're back and we're actually getting something mapped out right here the value on specific dates. This is great. But of course, this is not telling us a lot right now. We can make it much more descriptive. Before that, let's fix this TypeScript error right here by defining the type of the data that the useless hook will return. We can do it like so and specify get fields from list coming from Nest.js query refine dev. And then we can also specify what type of fields are we getting by providing another type right here, dashboard deals chart query. So this way we know exactly what we're dealing with coming from GraphQL types, which are generated for us by CoGen. Now, if you save it, you can see it's no longer complaining because it knows exactly what it's getting. Now let's fix our chart a bit by providing some additional config properties. We can provide the is stack property, which is going to be set to false. 
and this is used to stack the data on top of each other. In this case, we don't want that. We can also provide the series field, which will group the data based off of a specific state. In this case, we want to group it by state. There we go. So now we have lost and one, which is great. We also want to add the animation, which is going to be set to true. We also want to add the start on zero to false, which is going to ensure that the Y axis starts from zero. We can add the smooth property, which will make the chart smooth, meaning it will connect the points by a smooth curve. And then of course, we have to make sense of the data that we have in there. And for that, we can define the legend. First of all, we can maybe do a legend offset. So offset Y to something like minus six. This is going to move it a bit to the top. We can also define the Y axis and then define the tick count like this and set it to something like four. If you want, you can do something like six or you can do something like eight as well, but that's too much. I think four is just fine. Then we can also define a label for the Y axis by using the formatter function for matter, which is going to accept a V value of string and call a callback function. That's going to return a template string of a dollar amount and then a number of the value, but divided by 1000 like this. And then we can add K at the end. So we don't have those long numbers rather just 200 K, 300 K, 600 K and so on. Let's see if I have done that correctly. Before we had something like this, let me just get back. So before, if I reload the page right now, we had 200,000. And now it's going to say something like 200 K. That's good. Looks better. Next, we can also add a tooltip below the Y axis. So on hover, it's going to show a specific tooltip. We can do something like formatter where we get the data and then we can return a name of data dot state and we can also turn the value of a template string of the dollar amount number data dot value and then we can do the same thing divide by a thousand and then show the k so now if you hover you can see this nice looking tooltip but it's formatted to show the k value and I noticed that we do have a problem right here, so we can fix it by closing it right here. And I do believe it's going to look good now. There we go. That's much better. Now you can see all of those changes, I think all the way up to here have been just the quality of life changes. If I remove them and reload, it's still going to look good, right? We don't have the smooth edges. We have maybe uh, big numbers right here. Yeah, that are hard to read. But then if we do this and reload, once again, it's so much smoother, everything looks better and makes so much more sense. So I just wanted to take a moment to teach you how we can further style and design charts. Great. With that said, we can also apply some additional filterings to our use list by providing filters, which is going to be an array. Within that array, we can provide a single filter with a field of title. Operator is in and then value is either one or lost. That way we won't have any other states. We're going to only have one and lost to be sure that nothing bad is happening. And with that said, we are completely done with the deals chart. So let's close it and let's expand our browser to check it out. There we go. So now we have the deals. We can compare it with the deployed site. And on the deployed site, it does look like this part takes two thirds of the screen, whereas our current one only takes one additional third. So we'll definitely have to play a bit with the layout and positioning. But before we do that, let's fill out the top of our dashboard with these great looking highlighted cards. To create those cards at the top, we can collapse it and go back to our homepage. That's going to be the index of the home. We have our upcoming events and the deals chart. And what we want to do is add the cards right here on top. But now that I look at it, it's going to be easy to also expand the deals to its full glory. So we don't have to necessarily copy the properties from the upcoming events. We can rather make it exactly how it should be. So to do that, let's modify our structure to make space for the cards as well as for the deals. 
we can start by going within our div right here and creating a new row. This row will be for the cards on top. And that row is going to have a gutter equal to an array of 32 and 32. We can also then create a new column within it. And this call will have all the same properties as before, extra small, small, and then extra large, which is going to look something like this. We can keep it in a single line so it's easier to see. And then within this column, we can show one specific card. So within here, we can do something like dashboard, total count card like this. And now we can duplicate this three more times because we have three of these cards on top. So if you save that and go back, we can see three dashboard total count cards. Now we want to close this row right here. And then we want to open up a new row. This row will have the same gutters, the same styles, and then also we'll have the second column where this is not going to be eight, but rather it's going to be 16. This will allow our deals to extend two thirds of the screen. So now if I open this up, you can see the chart takes two thirds. And then these cards right here, very nicely extend throughout the full width of the screen. But of course, if we collapse them, you can start to notice that they go one below another exactly as they should on smaller width mobile devices. So with that said, let's create our dashboard total count card so we can use it within our homepage. That's going to be a new component within our components folder. And then we can go to our home and create a new file called total count card dot TSX. And there we can run RAFCE and rename it to dashboard total count card. There we go. Now we can, of course, export it from the index TS. That's going to be import dashboard total count cards from home count card. And then we can export it right here as well. Of course, don't forget to add a comma. Now, if we go back to our home page, we can actually import all three of these by turning it into a component self closing one for that matter. And we can then simply import it by pressing control space. And then it's going to nicely come in from add forward slash components. This now allows us to pass a couple of props to it. We'll have to define a resource for each one of these. So let's provide a resource equal to for the first one, it's going to be companies for the second one, it's going to be contracts. And for the third one is going to be deals. So this will show a real resource. Then we can define a special is loading property for each three of these. So we can say is loading. And by the way, if you're not sure how I'm doing these multiple cursors, I'm holding the alt key or the option key, I believe. And then I'm pressing multiple times to open up multiple cursors. And then I can just say is loading, which we're going to define really soon. And then finally, we need to figure out the total count of all three of these. So we can say total count is equal to data question mark dot data dot companies dot total count for the second one. It's not going to be companies. It's going to be contracts. And then for the third one, it's going to be deals. Now, of course, before we actually go ahead and start working on the card, we have to figure out where this is loading and where the data is coming from. And let me show you how we're going to get access to that data. We can again define const and then get the data and the is loading similar to what we have done with a use list. But this time we're going to use the use custom hook coming from refine dev core. Then we can provide an options object and define a URL just as an empty string. We can define the method, which is going to be get. So it allows us to completely customize what we're trying to get. And then we need to provide the meta which in this case is going to be the GQL query for exactly what we want to get GQL query of the dashboard total counts query imported from GraphQL queries. And let's dive into this query to see exactly what it returns. It's quite simple. It goes over the dashboard total counts and returns the total count of companies, contacts and deals. And now that I look at it, this is not contracts, rather it's contacts. So let's modify it. 
And I do believe that TypeScript would also let me know that soon if we use the proper type. So right here with the custom, we can define dashboard total counts query and import it from GraphQL types and close it. And if you do this, you can see that now it stands out so much how big this error is. Property contrast does not exist. Did you mean contacts? Yes, that's exactly what I meant. And we can fix it. Great. Now we're properly fetching all of that data, but it's complaining that the dashboard total count card doesn't accept any props. So let's dive into it and let's make it accept some. Now that we know exactly what they're passing, it's going to be quite easy. We just need to extract it from here. We need the resource that is loading and the total count. And we can just define those as a type of props, which we can define right here at the top type props is equal to first, we can start with resource, which is going to be either companies, contacts or deals. Then we can have something like is loading, which is a Boolean and total count, which is a number. Now that we're getting all of these props, let's turn these pieces of text into cards. So let's turn this div into a nice looking card coming from Ant D. You already know how it goes. If we save it already, we have three cards. Let's apply some styling such as a style of height of 96 pixels. Let's of course properly spell that right here within their code base. And let's also apply a padding of zero. There we go. Next, we can also apply some body style, which is going to be equal to padding of something like eight pixels on top, eight on the right side, eight on the bottom, and then 12 on the left side. There we go. This is good. And then we can also give it a size is equal to small. Within this card, we can have a div and this div will also have a style of its own. The style here will be a display of flex, turning it into a flex container, align items of center gap of eight between the elements to create some space and then a white space of no wrap. There we go. Within this div, we can show an icon for each card. So let's render an icon. So how would we render a different icon for each one of these cards? We could of course do something like icon and then define as icons for that specific resource like this. And then it would know exactly which resource it has to get it for. Let me show you how I would approach getting all of this data for these different cards. We can create something known as a constants folder. This is going to be within source and then create a new folder called constants. It's similar to utilities, but here you provide constant values, which you can reuse across your application. Think of it like a CMS for your app. You don't have to put all the values or text pieces within the JSX itself. You just write it here or have a non-developer person write it. And then you can simply use those values. So within here, let's create a new index.tsx and the full constants index TSX will be in the readme down below. So simply copy it and paste it right here. It's about 300 lines, but it's mostly just different labels as you can see. So we have different industry options, which we're going to use later on. We have different status options with the labels and values. We have different values for deals as well. And then we also have this. So this is a specific color of the card, the secondary color, and even the type of icon, the title and the data, which we want to use for this specific card. So this now allows us to go back and right at the top, try to extract specific values for each of the cards by saying const get the primary color, get the secondary color, get the icon and the title, which is equal to total count variance coming from add forward slash constants for that specific resource we're currently rendering. So it's going to be different for all three of these cards. Let me show you. We have our icon and the only thing we have to do is now render this icon right here. And there we go. We have three different colors as well as three different icons. Now below this icon, we can also render a piece of text, which of course has to be imported from the dot dot slash text and it's going to render a title. 
Once again, the title will be completely different depending on the card, or should I say resource. Next, this text can have a size equal to MD, a class name equal to secondary, as well as a style equal to margin left of eight pixels. There we go. Below this text and below the div, we can create a new div. This div will also have a style equal to display is flex and justify content is space between like so. We don't need the line items in this case. Within this div, we're going to show another text and this text will look into if we are currently loading and if we are loading, we want to show a skeleton for the button. So we can say skeleton dot button. It's going to be a self closing component. And of course we have to import skeleton from and design. And if we're not loading, we can actually render the total count for each one of these cards. So if I save it, we can see 30, 78 and 288 as well. Let's also provide some styles for this skeleton, even though we cannot see it right now such as a margin top to divide it a bit from the top of eight pixels, as well as a width of about 74 pixels. Like so. Great. Now let's of course make this text a bit bigger by providing some props to this text element, such as the size equal to XXXL. It's going to be a very big one. Let's also give it a strong property to make it bold and let's give it a style property of flex is one white space is no wrap flex shrink is going to be set to zero text align is going to be set to start margin left will be set to 48 pixels and we can also apply a special font variant numeric which is going to be tabular dash nums and this right here is numeric not a number so if we fix this and save it, this is looking very, very nice. Of course, the star of the show with these cards is not the number itself, but rather the realistic graph or the chart that appears for each one of these numbers in the respective primary color. So let me show you how to add that. It's going to be similar as we've done with the previous chart right here below the text. We want to show the area coming from add design plots. It's a self closing component to which we have to spread the config into. And we also provide style, which is going to be equal to width of about 50% so that the number takes the other 50. Of course, we have to define the config as we have done it before. We can do that right here below this resource const config of a type area config coming from add design plots is equal to, and then let's not forget the two most important parts, which is the data. In this case, we can get it by saying total count variance, which is coming from our constants for a specific resource, and then get the data for that specific one. We also need to define the X field, which is going to just be the index. So X field of index and then also the Y field of value. And if we save it, we can already see a great looking chart. But of course, it's far from looking like this. So let's make it look more like that. To do that, we have to play a bit with the config properties as we have done that before. We can add the append padding property of an array of one, zero, zero, zero. This will add some additional padding. We can then add a padding of zero overall. There we go. We can then sync view with padding set to true. We can make a auto fit property be also set to true. So it's going to fit it nicely. Tooltip is going to be false because we don't need to hover over it. Animation is also going to be set to false. We don't need to animate it here. Then the X axis is going to be completely false. We don't need to show any numbers on the X axis. Y axis will look a bit different though. It will have a tick count of 12. So that's a lot of lines right here, but we might not even need that. As you can see in the final one, we don't have it more on that later. The label or rather the style of the label 
will be stroke of transparent. So that looks like this. If you reload, you'll notice that there are no labels whatsoever. But now we're more interested in the grid. So if we go below the label and modify the grid of line, style, stroke to transparent as well. And there we go, we hide those lines. We also want to make it smooth. So it's all the way below this Y axis, which we can collapse momentarily, and then add a smooth property of true. That's more like it. We can then add a line to be of a specific color. So line color is primary color for that specific resource card. There we go. But we also want to change the area color. So let's modify the area style, have a callback function, and then return a new object of fill. We can apply a linear gradient right here. First, we can do something like L of 270, which is going to be 270 degrees of the gradient. Then we can apply the second one, which is going to be zero of hash FFF and then 0.2 as well. But let's modify it a bit. We don't need parentheses in this case. We just need a colon. So that's going to be like so. And finally, we need to provide a secondary color and then the primary color. So we can say 0.2 secondary color and then one of primary color, not secondary right here. This way, it's going to get a special area style and you can see a nice linear gradient, how it looks a bit more transparent at the start and then gets to the full color of this primary card. So you might have thought that these are just images or illustrations, but they're not. This is indeed a real chart happening in real time based off of the real resource number right here of companies, contacts and deals in pipeline. And with that done, we're done with the dashboard total count card. So let's go back to the home. Let's figure out why it's complaining right here, saying that it's possibly undefined. So if we go back here, we need to make sure that the total count is possibly undefined. There we go. And now it should no longer complain. So with this, we're completely done with the cards. We're also done with this part of the homepage. So now let's expand it. And would you look at this? Reload, we have a great looking chart right here which you can notice changed from the last time. So we indeed are working with the real data right here, which is pretty cool. And then all of these numbers will also be changing in real time. So now we have the upcoming events. We have number of companies, contact, total deals in pipeline. This data in this table can represent anything you want it to. The possibilities are endless, but I'm just showing you how we can connect this to this mock database and then work to create this dashboard using Refine and then using those special use custom or use list properties. Now let's focus on the last part of the dashboard homepage, which is the latest activities card. Of course, that's going to be on the homepage as well. So let's go right here below the last row of the upcoming events and deals chart. And let's create a final row. That's also going to have a gutter of an array of 32 and 32 and a style of just a bit of margin top to divide it from the elements we just created of 32 pixels. Within it, we can show a column that's going to have an extra small property of 24. So it's gonna take the full screen on all devices. And there we can render the dashboard latest activities. This is going to be a special component, which for now will break our application because it doesn't exist yet. But if we now go back and create this component within the components home and then create a new latest dash activities dot TSX component, we can run RAFCE, change this to latest activities in Pascal case, and then export it from the index right here by first importing it latest activities and then exporting it right here at the bottom. Now we can go back to our homepage and we can import it automatically by just saying latest activities coming from add forward slash components. We can move into it and we are ready to start developing 
the last component of our homepage, which is the latest activities. To get started with developing the latest activities, let's go ahead and turn it into a card. You know the drill, don't you? So this is going to be a card coming from Ant D, and then we can also give it some styles like we used to do before. We can give it something like a head style, which is going to have a padding of about 16 pixels, and immediately we can see the card appear on the bottom. We can also give it a body style with some additional padding, such as padding, zero on top and bottom, and one RAM on left and right. We can then define a card's title, which is going to be a custom div. So that's a div that will have a style equal to display of flex, align items of center, as well as a gap of eight, eight pixels specifically. Then we can also render an icon right here that's going to be an unordered list outlined. And we can also render a text. This text will be coming from the dot dot slash text. And it's going to say something like latest activities. Or rather not something, it's gonna say exactly latest activities. We can also give it a size equal to SM. We can give it a style equal to margin left of 0.5 rem. There we go, that's more like it. Now within this card, we can choose what we wanna render. And first we have to figure out if we are currently loading. So for now, I'm just gonna create a mock variable is loading, which I'm gonna set to false. And then we can create two different loading states. Or rather, you know what? Let me do a loading state to true first so we can simulate that loading empty window. Here, we can ask ourselves or ask the code if we are loading. And if we are, we can render a list element coming from ant D. It's going to be a self-closing list that of course has to have all of the properties that the list needs. And then also, if we are not loading, then we can also render another kind of list right here, which also will be a self-closing component. Now for this is loading list, it has no data right now, but we can also provide an item layout, which is going to be set to horizontal, and we can mock some data right here by saying data source is equal to, as before, we can do array dot from, where the length will be a specific number, such as maybe five right now, and then we can call a dot map on it, where we go through these elements. We don't need the first param, just the second one, which is the index, and for each one, we automatically return an ID of index, or rather I in this case. Try to bear with the syntax right here. I know it's not as straightforward as we might want, but it's just a dot map with an instant return, meaning you need a parenthesis right here that returns an object with an ID of I. There we go. And now you cannot see anything. And that's because we need to provide a render item how will each one of these items be rendered? Well, we can do the underscore because we don't need it and then the index. And for each one of these, we can return the latest activities skeleton, which is a self-closing component, which you need to import and provide a key equal to index. And with that, you can now see five of these cards nicely loading. But now is the time that we switch the is loading to false and start fetching real data within here. Of course, to be able to render it, we need to fetch the data beforehand. And for that, we're going to use our already well known hook called use list. But this time we'll go even deeper into pagination, sorting and filtering to ensure that you fully understand how does it work. So we can say const and we can get the data. In this case, that's going to be audit data, because we have the latest activities which are indeed audits. And that's going to be equal to use list coming from refine dev core, and we need to provide an object inside of which we can specify the resource of audit. There we go. If we save it, it's still not going to work. Why is that? Do you know? Well, since we're using GraphQL, we also have to provide a meta property right here and then define the GQL query for the request we're trying to make, which in this case is the dashboard underscore latest underscore activities audits query. There we go. Diving a bit deeper into it, 
we can see that we're going to have some variables of so filtering, sorting, and paging, which we're providing to the audits call. And then we want to get the total count of all audits, all of the nodes with these specific pieces of information created at, and then even the users that created those audits. So going back, if you scroll down, we still see no data. And that's because we're not yet passing these audits into the list down below. Before we go ahead and pass it, let's first extract some of the additional benefits that the use list hook provides to us. Things such as the is loading, which we can rename to is loading audit. We also have the is error, as well as the error itself. Now, what we can do is console log. Now, what we can do is console log the audit to see what do we get back from it. Let's do it right here and then open up the inspect element under our console. And if I reload, let's see what do we get back. We have a couple of undefineds and they keep getting cold, which might mean that it's best to close this page because we do have some kind of a loop happening right here. But thankfully, I believe Refine closes the loop for us and makes it not happen again. But basically, it's trying to read the nodes right here, which apparently it cannot do. We also have a problem with auth right here. And that's because I've made a bit of a mistake and I've said audit right here, whereas we should have get the resources of audits, plural. So if I save this right now, you can see that we get back data this time for real. It has 1,086 audits and we have a lot of different pieces of data with different actions for each audit, changes, created at, target entity, user, and so much more. Exactly what we're defining that we want to get back from this GQL query. But now bear with me. We don't simply want to use the audits themselves and then show them right here. We want to get the activities from these audits. So what we can do is first get the deal IDs. So we can say const deal IDs, which is going to be equal to audit question mark dot data question mark dot map, where we get each individual audit and we return an audit question mark dot target ID like so. So this is only going to give us the IDs. And now we can use those deal IDs to make another call. Then we'll be able to get all of these deals as you can see right here. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to fetch all deals with the IDs from the audit data by using another use list const data. This time we're getting deals with the is loading property, which we can rename to is loading deals. And that's going to be equal to a use list hook call inside of which we can provide the resource of deals. So we specify which resource we want to perform the operation on. And then here we can even provide query options. This allows us to disable the query if there are no deal IDs. So we can say enabled if double exclamation mark to turn it into a Boolean deal IDs question mark dot length. And of course there has to be a comma right here. Then in this case, we can disable pagination by saying pagination mode off. And we can also apply some additional filtering. Keep in mind the app is not working. Do you know why? It's because we haven't yet provided a special GQL query for this call. And under filters, we can filter out by field is ID, operator is in, and then value is deal IDs. So we only want to filter out those that are within the deal IDs that we get from the audits. And finally, we can provide the metadata and here define a GQL query, which is going to be dashboard underscore latest, underscore activities, underscore deals query. Let's see exactly what it does. It's getting the deals this time, and it's returning all of the deals as well as their total count and to which company does that deal belong to. Now that we have that, if we have any errors, we can say if there is an error. In that case, we can simply maybe console log the error as well as return the null so we don't see anything and our app doesn't break. Next, if we're loading, we can then check both states, is loading audit or is loading deals, which now we can do. And now we're getting the audits from the first list. Then we map over their deal IDs and we use them to fetch the deals using the second use list. And now we have the deals 
which are the actual data that we want to showcase. So now going back to our list, we can actually provide the data, which is deals. We can do that by saying item layout is going to be horizontal. And then immediately data source is audit question mark dot data. Now you might be thinking, why did we do all of this extra work to get the deals data using another list? If we're never actually using it, we're just using the audits. Well, that's because the original data source is audits, but we're going to use the data from the deals when we render each individual item. So we can say render item where we get back the item we're currently showing. And then we need to find the deal with the ID from the audit data by saying cons deal is equal to deals question mark dot data dot find find me a deal where the deal dot ID is triple equal to item dot target ID or undefined. There we go. So now we're getting that specific deal. And for each deal that we get, we can now return a list item. So list dot item. And we can provide the list dot item dot meta, which is going to be a self closing function. And to it, we can pass all of the data that we might ever need, such as a title, inside of which we're going to use the dayjs library, which we can import at the top and provide to it a deal dot question mark dot created at, and then we can call the dot format and format it in something like MMM DD dash Y, 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 Y dash H H colon M M. And now if we save it, you can see all of these different dates appear right here. Why are we saying triple M M? Well, that's for Jan or Feb, right? Three letter months. Then we can do DD for a short date. We can do a full year and then even hours and minutes. It's so easy to format it with the DayJS library. You can even add seconds, I believe, dash SS, and then you have seconds as well, right? But we don't need to go that far in this case. Let's also provide an avatar for each one of these deals. We can say avatar is equal to and then we can render a custom avatar component, which we have created before. This time it's going to be of a shape is set to square. We can give it a size of 48, a source equal to deal question mark dot company dot avatar URL. And a name is equal to deal question mark dot company dot name. If we save it, we can now see this for each one of these but it doesn't really seem to get a real company image. And the reason why we're not getting them is because I don't think we are finding the correct deals belonging to specific audits. The deal ID could potentially be a string and we're comparing with a target ID, which could be a number. So I believe instead of a triple, we can use the double equal sign right here. There we go. That works. Or we can stringify this by wrapping it in a string constructor. If we reload, that works as well. There we go. Let me also put this in a new line so you can better see what's happening. We do the dot find and that looks something like this. Deal ID has to be equal to stringified item target ID. Great. And now we have all of these companies and the dates. Let's also apply something else instead of a avatar and title. And that something is a description, which is going to provide us all of the other information which we might need. This description is going to be wrapped in a space property coming from and D with a size is equal to four. That can be a number right here. Then within that space, we can have a text property that's going to be strong and it's going to render the item dot user question mark dot name. There we go. So we can see admin user for most of these. Then below that, we can have another text, which is going to look into the action of that item by saying item dot action. And if it's triple equal to all uppercase create, we can then say created else we can say moved. There we go. Created right below that text. We can have another text that's also going to be strong and it's going to render the deal dot title. We can add a question mark right here in case it doesn't exist. There we go. Modern frozen car. Then we can add another text right below. And this text will simply say deal. 
And then we can add another one below inside of which we also want to look into the action by saying item dot action. If it's triple equal to create, then we want to say in else we want to say something like two because created in and moved to makes a lot of sense. And finally, the last text element that's going to also be strong. This one can say deal question mark dot stage question mark dot title and save. There we go. Now this one is a bit harder to see on mobile devices, but if we expand it, there we go. You can now see that this makes more sense. Admin user created recycled fresh towels deal in you. There we go. In this first one, I can see we don't have the admin user here, but that's okay for now because all of the other ones have it. And we can see the images, the dates, and we can see all of the different data about a specific deal being made coming right here through latest activities. And we have done that by using the combination of two different useless calls. So it's doing them one after another. First, it gets all the audits, and then it gets all the deals and we use the data to fuse it together to get the latest activities. With that said, we can now scroll up and would you look at that? We have all of these great looking dashboard home cards, the upcoming events, the deals, a lot of different charts, a lot of stuff is happening here and it's looking great. But it's not about this specific information. It's not about Michael Scott from the office or the annual company picnic. It's about you being a capable developer and utilizing all of the tools that are at your disposal. And in this case, that's refine when it comes to building phenomenal dashboards and using the properties such as use list to get the data automatically using GraphQL queries and fusing multiple of these together to make complex actions. Refine scales with you. And once you have the setup ready, it will scale indefinitely and allow you to build complex applications. With that said, the latest activities are now complete. And with those, the homepage is as well. Before we move to the other pages, let's go back to what we talked earlier regarding refine dev tools, open it up and go to the monitor section. So many hooks, but exactly the ones we're using, nothing more and nothing less. If you take a closer look, you'll see that it also indicates where we're using a specific hook. For example, we're using the use one in account settings. But if you were to check the form, we're not using that hook. We're using use form. Interesting, isn't it? Well, the dev tool is telling us that in account settings, we're using the use form, which in turn is then calling the use one. Pay attention to the trace details. Click on it and you'll not only witness the entire process, but also the data we are receiving from that hook in that component. This is what sets this dev tool feature apart. We can observe the entire success and failure journey, where it kicks off, what's happening behind the scenes and the data it brings back to us. No more relying on console logs. The same process applies to other hooks like use list and more. Feel free to dive into it deeper to understand the refines concepts in more detail. But now let's pick up where we left off. We have added our latest component right here which means that our dashboard is now done and we are ready to move to the second page of the day, which is companies. So what do you say that we navigate over to the app.tsx and add the second route right here so we can actually navigate to it. We can create a new route, which will have a path of forward slash companies and element will be the company list page like this. Of course, we have to create it so we can go to our pages and create a new folder called company list. Within it, create a new index.tsx file where we can run RAFCE and create a company list component. Then we can just, instead of doing the default, we can do a typical export const right here and we can export it from our index.tsx as well by saying export everything from company list, which allows us to go back to our homepage and import company list, not page, just company list. It's going to be enough from that slash pages allows us to navigate to it. 
and navigate within our application as well using built-in routing. It is as easy as that, which means that we are now ready to start developing our company list. And now that I mention it, it might make more sense to rename our folder to just company, which then allows us to call our file list.tsx. And of course, we also have to modify the import of that file right here in the index. Now, what this allows us to do is to later on create a create as well as edit files within the same folder. And of course, this one being the company list. So with that said, let's get started with creating your company list. This is what we're aiming for. A table that has one column that is completely searchable, another that accumulates deal amounts for that company, and then also actions that allow us to edit and delete specific companies, as well as a button to create them. So without any further ado, let's begin by modifying this div to become a list. Now this list won't come directly from and D rather it will come from refine dev and D. It's the refines version of a list component, allowing us to adding just a tiny bit of magic when it comes to managing lists and resources. For example, I mean, look at that. We already have companies as well as a button that says create. All of this has been created for us automatically just because we have added a route of companies. I mean, look at this. We already have the company's title as well as a button to create more. Of course, the route is not working yet, but we'll make it work soon. For now, let's display some companies. Let's apply some props such as breadcrumb, which is gonna be set to false. This just allows us to see the path of our table, which we don't need to do at this point in time. We can also render the header buttons. And in this case, we can have a callback function that returns exactly what we need. Make sure to put this as a parenthesis and not as a curly brace because we have an instant return. And here we want to return a create button coming from refine dev and D. This button will allow us to navigate to a specific path to create new companies. So let's make use of refines use go hook. Const go is equal to use go coming from refine dev core. This now allows us to navigate to a different path. So right here within this create button, we can add an on click function where we have a callback function. And here we can go to, and we can provide an object. First, we need to provide a to property, which is going to be pointing to resource of companies, as well as an action of create. It is as easy as that. You don't have to define a path or anything. You just define the resource and the action and the path will be done automatically for you. Right below the two, we can also provide additional options. In this case, keep query, which can be set to true. In this case, we wanna merge the current query. If we do this, the current query parameters will be merged with the new query parameters. And also we wanna provide a type. Type can be one of three things. It can be push, replace, and reload. In this case, we can put replace so that it completely replaces the current entry on the history stack of the browser. And now if you click on create, it's going to point us to localhost 5173 companies new, but we haven't yet created the route for that. So let's go back and we're gonna do that soon. For now, we need to focus on displaying the table. So let's go right here inside of the list and let's render a table component coming from and D. This table will accept something known as table props. And once again, Refine makes it so easy. Instead of using the use list hook, which we used a couple of times so far, this time we're gonna use the use table hook. So we can say const table props as well as filters and set that to equal to use table. It's gonna work similar to how the use list works, but with some added benefits. First of all, we can again provide the resource as we usually do of companies. And let's not forget that we also have to add a meta property right here to specify our GQL query. So we can say GQL query is going to be equal to companies 
list query. And you can see that now everything breaks. That's because we have to import use table from refine dev and D, make sure that it's coming from and D and not from core. And we can now save it and reload. And we can see a table that says no data. Now let's explore this GQL query. And we can see that we have some variables, which we can later on pass, such as filtering, sorting and paging. And then we return the total count of all the companies and individual companies with the ID name and avatar URL, as well as get the sum of all deals in this company by doing the aggregate of all of the values. Great. Now that gives us the table props. While we're here, let's also add the pagination. We can do that by simply saying pagination is equal to, and then page size of about, let's do 12 elements per page. Now we can go below and within this table, we can spread all of the table props. We can then also define pagination prop inside of which we can spread the table props dot pagination and we can save it. Now we have page one out of three. Of course, what is a table without some table columns? So within the table, let's define a table dot column like this. And in this case, it's going to be a self closing component, but it will require quite a few props. First of all, it's going to require a data index of name. So we know what we're showing. In this case, we're showing the name of the company. We can then add a title for this column, such as company title. There we go. That's better already. Now let's also do some filtering. So we can first specify the default filtered values, which will be equal to a call of the get default filter coming from refine dev core, which we call provide the ID. And then the second parameter is going to be the filters on its own. This won't do anything, but it will allow us to do some filtering later on, such as when we add the filter icon, this icon can be something like search outlined, just a simple self closing icon which we can import from and design icons on its own. It's not going to show if we don't specify a drop down that will show up once we click on the icon. So we can say filter drop down is equal to a callback function where we get access to those props and then we can instantly return something. So make sure to put parentheses and then return a filter drop down component inside of which you can spread all the props and then expand it like so and put a single input within it. That's going to have a placeholder equal to search company. Of course, both of these have to be imported from refine dev and this one too input just coming from and D. If we now save this, you can see this little search icon on the top, right? If you click it, Soon enough, we'll be able to search through different companies. Now let's turn these titles into something a bit more exciting when we can actually show the image. So to do that, we have to modify the render of each item by saying render where we have a callback function with the value as well as the record. And then for each one, we return a space, which comes from and design. And within the space, we can render a custom avatar coming from components, custom avatar. We can give it a shape, which is equal to square, a name equal to record dot name, as well as a source equal to record dot avatar URL. And if we save it, you can now see all of these great company logos below our custom avatar. We can show a piece of text. And that text will have a style equal to white space, no wrap, and has to be imported from components text and can say something like record dot name. There we go. So now we have the company and the logo. That's it for the first column. And we can move on to the next one. The next one will show the open deals amount, allowing us to aggregate of all of the deals for a specific company. So let's create a new table dot column 
And we can also provide a type for this component right here saying that it is a company. So we can do it like this company. And we have to import this from GraphQL schema types. This way, it's not going to complain about the record because it will know it exists. And we can do the similar thing right here, table column, and then add a company as a type. Pretty interesting way to use TypeScript. Now the second one will have a data index equal to total revenue. And here we can also add a title of open deals amount. Pretty simple so far. It immediately shows up and we can render a new item. That's going to have a value as well as the record. And we want to immediately return a piece of text right here. That text will render the currency number coming from utilities. And we can pass to it a company question mark dot deals aggregate question mark dot zero dot sum question mark dot value or zero. So we're passing the current information. And I noticed that here, we can call this company, which makes a bit more sense. So we're getting the current values of all the aggregate deals coming back right here. And how do I know that this company has it? Well, first of all, I can check it out in the type. If I go here, we can see aggregate, such as deals aggregate right here, which is exactly what we used. Or I can go to our GraphQL query and see that we have deals aggregate, which is exactly how we called it right here. Great. With that said, we are returning it. The second column is there and we can focus on the third column, which will be the actions column, allowing us to edit and delete our rows. So right below this one, let's simply copy it for now and duplicate it. This one will have a data index of ID. It's going to have a title of actions. It's going to have a fixed of right. So it's always fixed to the right side. And within the render, we simply need to get back the value. And we can return a space element. And within it, we can render the edit button, which is coming from refine dev and D. And we can pass to it a hide text. So it's just the icon, a size of small, as well as a record item ID equal to value that we get back. And now if we save this, you can see that we immediately get the edit button and we can duplicate it and also get the delete button, which we can import from refine dev and D. This is how seamlessly everything works together. Once you use the power of the framework that is given to you, keep in mind, we are within this current table. This table gets all of the props passed right here. And it knows that this is a table that's showing the companies. And because it knows that it can automatically generate the buttons for editing and deleting specific nodes within that table. So now if I click edit right here, you're going to notice that the URL is going to change to companies edit one. And even though we cannot see anything on the page yet, we know that the routing works. And now we simply have to implement that route. Similar thing for delete as well as create, but Hey, at least we know that now our list is there. So now if I expand it a bit, you can see how it looks like looking great on tablet devices. And soon enough, we're going to implement the search as well as some additional filtering. So let me show you how simple that is. Everything is happening within this use table, similarly to what we had with the use list before, right below the pagination, we can apply something known as sorters. And these are used to sort data with any query. It's an object that accepts initial sorters. So we can say initial, and that is an array of different sorting possibilities we want to use, such as field created add, and we want to sort that in order of descending. So we can just do this. I reload it, and there it is. Now, alongside sorters, we can also apply filters. So we can say filters. And then we can add an object where we provide initial, and then we can add an array with all the filters. For example, we can do an object where field is name and the operator is going to be contains. And then the value 
of undefined. So we want to filter out all of the undefined values. And I just noticed initial should be an array instead of an object. So if I fix it, we are good. So pagination, sorting, filtering, it's all there. What do we need? Well, here you can also add the on search functionality. So right here below the resource, we can say on search, which is going to be a callback function that gets the values of the search. And then you can return an array that contains an object based off of which you want to do the search. For example, field is name operator is going to be contains and then value is going to be values dot name. And of course we have to add a comma here. So now if you save this, if you go to this search and search for something like, let's do this one right here and filter, you can see that it automatically works right out of the box because we implemented this function. It goes ahead and applies filters to this entire table and automatically this table reflects it because of the table props. And this means that we're officially done with the list. Now that we can see the list, we can focus on adding new companies to our list by making the create button work. So let's do that next. And you might wonder, how do we even approach doing that? Well, don't worry, we're gonna go through the process a couple of times. So let me show you how to do it with the companies. You might remember that we have created the list before, and this list is within the company folder. So right here, we can also create a new file called create.dsx and run RAFCE. Here we have a create component, which we also need to export from this index. So we can export everything from company create, meaning we have to create a route for it. And you know where all of the routes are? They're within the app.tsx. Right here where we have the company's list, we can also add the company's new. So let's turn this route into a route group by opening it like this. And then within path companies, we don't have to render the element right here. Rather, we can render a child route right here. That's going to be a route that's going to have an index property, meaning it is just companies. And then the element is the same as it was company list. But now we can also create a new child route, which is going to be route with a path of new. And the element is going to be company create page, or I think we just called it create page, or I think we just called it create, which is coming from pages company create. And if we save it and go back to our current application, we can press create. And indeed, it does point to the create. We can see that right here. If we paste create a couple more times, we can see that we are right here and we are ready to start developing it. If you think about it, this is going to be our first modifier action. The first one that is not a query, but rather a mutation. So let me show you how to do it. First, we're going to wrap everything in a company list. This is the same component we have created before. It's coming from dot slash list. There we go. So it's exactly the same thing as before. But now within it, we can also render a modal, which is coming from ant D. This modal will of course have to get some props. And where do we get props from? And so far, you already know where do we get props for lists or tables. We get them from refine hooks. And the situation is going to be exactly the same here. You can start noticing the patterns and the structure emerge. We can say const form props as well as modal props is equal to use modal form. So this is a special refine dev at the type of form to which we can provide options. First, we need to provide the type of the action. In this case, it's create because we want to create new companies. Then we can set the default modal visibility in this case to true because we are already on the create page. So we can show it. We also need to specify a resource of companies, meaning what are we creating? 
we can specify if author mutation or form submission we want to redirect. In this case, we can set the redirect to false because we're already there. Then we need to choose a mutation mode and that's used to determine how a mutation should be performed. For example, it can be optimistic, pessimistic, or undoable. In this case, we want to have a pessimistic update. So we can say mutation mode is going to be pessimistic. What does that mean? Well, it means that the redirection and UI updates are executed only after the mutation is fully successful. Then we can have an on mutation success, meaning what's going to happen after the mutation success, and we can simply navigate. And the way that we're going to navigate, we're going to do it with a go to function. So we can once again use the const go is equal to use go, which Refine uses for navigation. And then we can define the new function called const go to list page, which is a function that calls the go method and passes the two property of resource is companies and action is list. So we simply go back to the list with the options of keep query set to true, as well as the type is set to replace because it's a modal. So we wanted to replace it because we don't have to go back to the modal. It's just there. We close that. So now we can use this function, go to list and call it on mutation success. Finally, and most importantly, we need to provide the meta tag or the meta property where it's going to be a GQL, not a query, but finally for the first time ever in this video, a GQL mutation of create company mutation. We can command click it to see how does it work. It's a mutation that creates a company based off of the create company input, and it just creates a company and returns its ID and the sales owner's ID. That's it. And whenever you want to learn a bit more about how these queries and mutations work, you can just go to API CRM refine dev GraphQL and just paste them right here. And you can immediately see the full input. It might make more sense with more detailed code highlighting. Then you can provide some query variables in this case, the input, and you can call it and play with it within the playground. It's a bit easier with queries as you can visually see what's happening without having to even input variables. But in this case, we'll test it in action. So now that we know how does this create company mutation work, and now that the use model form has all of the options it needs, we can now pass the form props to the model. We can do it in a similar way of how we did it with the table. Spread dot 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 modal props. Then we can also add a property called mask and we can set it to true. This determines whether a mask is visible underneath the model. When this is set to true, you'll be able to see that semi-transparent dark background. Right here, we can also call the on cancel property. What happens there? We just call the same go to list page. We want to navigate back to the list. We can add a title of create company and a width of about 512 pixels. Now, if we save this, we are now on just the company's new. And if we click create, nothing yet happens because there's nothing within the modal. So let's render a form. This form will also accept some form props coming from the same use modal form. So that's going to be dot, dot, dot form props and the layout will be set to vertical. Of course, the form has to be imported from and the, the form itself has to have some form items. So let's add a form dot item. This first one will have a label equal to company name and a name equal to name. And we can also add some rules such as the object with an array of one rule where required is set to true. Within it, we can render an input coming from ant D. It's a self-closing input that has a placeholder of please enter a company name. Now, if we save it, we should have enough to be able to see our modal, but still nothing happens. 
And that's because our company list is not yet made to accept the children. So to fix it, we can go into it and make sure that it gets children right here under props. And we can add a type of react.props with children. There we go. And now we can use those children right here within this table. Or rather, that's going to be below the table. If we go down, we have the table, we have the list, and then right here below the list, we can render the children. But of course, we have to close it so we can wrap everything in a single div. And of course, we have to actually open up the div right here on top. If we save it, now we have a beautiful modal because now company list can accept and show children elements. And here we have our first input to enter a company name. I believe to create a company, we need two different inputs. We need the one for the name, and then we need to tie it to a specific sales owner. So to do that, we can add a second form input, form.item. This one will have a label of sales owner, a name of sales owner ID, and rules of required as before, which is set to true. Within it, we're not gonna render an input, rather a select element coming from at D. This select will be self-closing. It will have a placeholder equal to, please select a sales owner. And this one is quite interesting. It immediately shows, but we have absolutely no data right here to refer it to. We need to pick some sales owners from our database. And conveniently, Refine exposes yet another hook called use select. It's almost like whatever you're using, be it a modal or a list or a select, there's a hook that helps you to use it to its fullest potential and simplifies dealing with CRUD operations. So in this case, let's define a const, get the select props and query results, which is equal to use select like this. This use select is going to refer to the resource of users because we need to get the sales owner and we can provide it an option label of name and a meta property to know what we need to fetch and a GQL query of users underscore select underscore query, which we can import from queries. This is how it looks like. In this query right here, we're getting the users with three variables, filter, sorting, and paging as usual. We get all users, we get the total count of all users, and then get specific fields for each user, such as ID, name, and avatar URL. With that, we now have to select props and query results. So let's import the use select coming from refine dev and D, not from refine dev core, and let's use it right here within the select. You know the drill, we can simply spread all of the select props, and immediately you can see how it pulls all of the users from the database for us. Even Tabi is here. Now let's also provide some additional options for the select by saying options. And then here we can choose how do we want to map over the data and what we want to show for each one. So we can say something like query results dot data question mark dot data dot map where we get each individual user. And for each user, we automatically return meaning parentheses and then an object values of user dot ID as well as a label that's going to render a new component called select option with avatar. So instead of simply showing a title or a name of that person, we can render this component and to it, we can pass a name equal to user dot name, as well as avatar URL equal to user dot avatar URL, or if that doesn't exist, undefined. So now we can create this simple component by going to components and then creating a new file called select dash option dash with dash avatar dot TSX. 
and we can develop it by running RAFCE. This is going to be a select option with avatar that accepts two props, the avatar URL, the name, and sometimes there's also going to be a shape. And we also need to define those props. So let's define the types at the top. Type props is equal to, it's going to have a name of string, a avatar URL, which is going to be an optional string. And it's also going to have a shape, which is going to be either circle or square. Great. Now we can return a div or rather before we return anything, let's just make sure to use this within our component. So going back here, we need to import select option with avatar coming from components, select option with avatar. And if we reload, nothing is showing. Let's try to see why that is. If we go to the console, we can see cannot read properties of data. I'm guessing that's coming from here, query results. That's because it's query result, not results. This is my bad. And TypeScript was kind enough to already let me know that it doesn't exist. Maybe we need to use query result. There we go. So if we fix this, now we can see that we get a list of nothing because we are now yet to return something. And that something is a div that's going to have a style equal to display of flex, align items equal to center, and a gap of eight pixels. Within it, we can render a custom avatar, which we had before, to which we can pass a shape of shape, a name of name, and a source of avatar URL. If we save this, you should be able to see a lot of friendly faces. Now, the only thing they're missing is a name. So let's render a text element, which we can import from dot slash text. And within it, we can render a name. So you can see how to make this custom. We had a name and now we have connected the photo and the name, and it's all here within this select element. Here, if the data is undefined, we need to return an empty array. So we can say question mark, question mark, empty array right here. So it's not going to complain. And also we can define a type of what data is coming back from the query result so that this user knows that it actually has access to the ID. So we can do that right here within the use select where we can define get fields, which is coming from nest.js query. And then we can define users select query from GraphQL types. And this way, if we save it, it's complaining right here below. I think that's because we said just get fields, but we instead need to get get fields from list. Yes, this is the correct one because then it has the option label. Great. So now you can see that we have our create where we can enter the company name, such as JavaScript mastery, and we can choose a sales owner, such as the admin user or Michael Scott. But you can see if we click it, it seems like nothing is happening. The value is not populated. So let's figure that out. If we scroll just a bit down, you can see that I typed values here instead of value. As soon as we fix it to value, enter JavaScript mastery, and then choose Michael Scott as the owner that works perfectly. But now the question is what happens when I click save? Does it just work? Let's try it out. There we go. We have the loading. We have the alert happening automatically. We have JavaScript mastery as the new company with zero open deal amount, which is exactly how it should be at the start. This is great. We have just implemented the create action. Let's expand this a bit so we can see it in its full glory. I'm going to click create and we're going to enter something like let's do the office and the sales owner is going to be, let's do Dwight and click save immediately in real time with a pop-up and automatic update. We can see a new row get added to the database. Now that we have the list, we have the search as well. We can filter the values. Finally, let's go ahead and implement the edit. That's going to be a completely new route. 
So let's put this side by side and let's go back to the app TSX and let's add a new route. We can duplicate this one and modify the path to say edit forward slash colon ID because it's going to be dynamic and then we can create a new page. You know where that page is going to go. It's going to go within pages, company, and we're going to call it edit.tsx. Run RAFCE. We can create a new edit component and we can automatically export it right here from company edit. Then we can go back to app TSX and we can import edit coming from pages company edit. Now, if we reload, you can see that we have an empty edit page, which makes it a perfect empty slate to start working on the editing functionality. And just to remind ourselves, this is how it should look like on the finished version. You click right here and you have this beautiful form with even the contacts right here on the bottom, but the form is the key part right here. So let's turn this into this. To get started with the edit functionality, we can first wrap everything in a div. And then within that div, we can immediately show the row. Of course, the row coming from ant D. Then right within it, we can show a column also coming from ant D. And we can define some gutters and sizes. So first, let's do a gutter for the row of an array of 32 and 32. And for the column on extra small devices, it can take the full width and on extra large devices, it can take half the screen. Now inside of here, we want to render the edit functionality coming from refine. That's refine dev and D, but it's not edit button. It's rather the whole edit form. So it looks like it doesn't allow us to auto import it. But if we go here and say import edit, which is coming from add refine dev forward slash and D we have our edit. Oh, the reason why I didn't give it automatically is because there's an import declaration conflict with the local declaration. So we can change this over to something like edit page. There we go. Now we're good. Now this edit has to correspond to a specific form and you already know the drill. We can use the use form hook coming from refine by saying const destructuring something and then saying is equal to use form coming from refine dev, but it's again going to come from the refine dev at D because it's connected to the form from add design. Now this hook call will accept some options such as redirect, which is going to be set to false as we don't want to redirect and also the meta property which is going to be equal to a GQL mutation once again, because we are updating the company. So we can say update underscore company underscore mutation. And if you look into it, you can see that we accept the input, which is going to contain all of the properties needed to update the company. And then we return the updated information. Now here I should have used just a Boolean variable, not a string. Once again, TypeScript saves me there. And then we can destructure some things from use form, such as save button props, form props, form loading, and query result. Now we can use those right here within our edit. First, let's pass the is loading equal to form loading. Let's pass the save button props equal to save button props and a breadcrumb set to false. If we save it, still nothing is showing up here. That's because we're going to put something within this edit and that something will be a form. So let's import the form from add D and let's give it the dot 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 form props by spreading it and giving it a layout of vertical. Of course, a form has to have something within it. So right here, we can render our custom avatar and we can self close it. Now, why custom avatar? That's because it's the first thing right here within our form. So let's just provide it a shape, which is equal to square. Let's give it a source equal to something like avatar URL. And this avatar URL will be coming back from the query result. 
So we can say something like const destructure the avatar URL as well as the name, which is equal to query result question mark dot data question mark dot data once again, or just an empty object so we don't have any issues. Now, if we save it, we might need to pass additional props such as name, where we get name initials from utils of our specific name. And finally, we can also pass the style of width of about 96, height of 96 as well, and a margin bottom of 24 pixels. Now, if we reload, it looks like we have an error. So if I inspect and go to console, we can see cannot read properties of undefined reading split at get name initials. So it looks like we're not getting back the name. In that case, we can provide or an empty string. There we go. So now that works. And we do get back the custom avatar because it doesn't have the name, but it does have the photo. Now, right below the custom avatar, we want to show a select field right here. In this case, the sales owner. And this is exactly the same select that we used in the previous component. So we can just reuse it here as well. Let's go back to our create. That's going to be right here. And let's grab this entire form item with the select property. And let's just paste it right here below our custom avatar. That's right here. We of course have to indent it and modify the label to be sales owner. That's good. Name is going to be sales owner ID. And we don't need the required in this case, but we do need initial value, which is going to be form props question mark dot initial values question mark dot sales owner question mark dot ID. And we don't need double curly braces right here. So this is going to pull the initial value from the form. We need to import select from add D. And let's not forget, we have to implement the use select hook. So going back here, we can also copy this entire part for the use select hook and just paste it right here above the return. We have to import the use select from refine dev and D not the core take care and also all the types and these types right here and the user select query. Now we should have almost everything we need for our select, but it does complain a bit here about the query result. And that's because we have already referred to the query result here. So we can rename it here to query result users. And now I can just use this variable right here below query result users. And we also need to import the select option with avatar. And now I believe we'll have everything we need. So if we go back, there we go. Tabby was immediately selected and we can select another user as well. So now we have the select, which we have created for the create company. In this case, we do want to modify the select just a bit by providing it a pagination, which is going to be set to mode off. We don't want to paginate over these. We want to show all of them. So now this is looking good to me. Now let's go below. We have to implement the company size, which is going to be another select. Of course, much easier than this one because we won't be pulling anything from the database. Rather, we can just go below this form item and create another form dot item, which is going to have a select within it, a self closing one with options equal to company size options coming from add forward slash constants. And that's it. You can just choose the value right below it. We need to implement the total revenue, which is going to be an input with an icon. So let's create a new form item below form dot item. This one will have the input number coming from and D. And we can give it a couple of things such as auto focus, because this is the first input besides the selects, we can give it the add on before equal to a dollar sign. That's going to look like this. The min value is going to be set to zero. 
the placeholder will be set to something like 0, 0, 0. And if we save it, you can see that now we can actually type something and we have real values. You could go ahead and implement a formatter here as well to format the commas for decimal points, but in this case, I'm happy with what we have here. And finally, we need a couple more inputs for the industry, business type, country, and the website. So let's add them one after another. Below this form item, we can create a new form.item, and within it, we can create a select field. This select is going to have options equal to industry options coming from constants. And we can duplicate this form item one, two, three times. All of these four inputs also need to have labels, not the selects, but the form inputs. So let's select all of these, create cursors, and then say label is equal to an empty string. The first one is industry. The second one is going to be business type. The third one is country. And the fourth one is website. If we save it, we have this. Now on the second one, we're going to have business type options coming from constants. Country is not going to be a select, rather it's going to be an input coming from ant D. And instead of options, it's going to have a placeholder equal to country and a form input is going to have a name of country too. And finally, the last one is also going to be an input with a placeholder of website. So let's do it like this and a name of website as well. So we can connect the form item with the input. There we go. That's good. And the values are pre-filled based off of that name. We can also choose the industry and the business type. Now, if we try to change the sales owner to somebody like Oscar, we can press save and successfully updated company. Now, if we go back to companies, you can see that we have our Goldman Sachs and right here we have Oscar Martinez. Now, if we go to the deployed version of the website and choose a specific company, you'll see that right here at the bottom, we'll also have a new table that says contacts which is a complete table with name where you can search for it, title and stage even that allows you to filter different values. It's cool that here you can filter by a specific select field, not just by the input field. And finally, you have actions like email and phone call. This is cool and all, but we have already built a table. It's this one right here. So let me simplify this for you. You can go right here to our company and create one final file right here called contacts-table.tsx. In the readme down below, you can find the complete contacts table, copy it, and then paste it right here. And with it, we also have to provide an additional contact status tag, which is going to essentially just color out these different tags that you can see right here. So let's create it by going to components, and then create a new folder called tags. And then within here, create a new file called contact dash status dash tag dot TSX. And once again, in the readme down below, you can find the complete contact status tag, copy it and paste it here. It's basically a glorified switch, which looks into the case and then modifies the icon and the color for that specific tag we're showing. So now we can go back here. We can remove all of these imports and manually import these components, such as text coming from add forward slash components text, import the custom avatar from components custom avatar, and import the contact status tag from components as well. If we save this, we can now use this contact table right within the edit. So below the last call, create a new call that's going to have an extra small of 24 and an extra large of 12, meaning just half the screen. And here we can render the company contacts table imported from dot slash and save it. Now, if we go to our current website and scroll down, you'll be able to see a beautiful contacts table 
that works right off the bat, and it's built on top of the same principles that we have used before, such as the use table, where we just specify the resource for which the table is to be used. We do some sorting, filtering. I went ahead and commented everything out so you can fully understand what is happening here. But once again, it's just using refine and design elements and then using corresponding refine hooks to simply pass the props and make it work right out of the box. So with that said, if I now expand this edit company, it's looking like a real dashboard. We have a complete list which works in real time where you can create a new company by using this modal or you can edit it by pressing this icon. And here you can enter all of the details such as enterprise, you can enter a specific amount, industry, business type, and press save. It's gonna successfully update the company. And on the right side, you can also see the contacts or the people belonging to that company with complete sorting and filtering capabilities. Don't forget that you can also paginate this in case you have more contacts. You can also refresh this or go back to companies. Finally, let's check the delete. If we try doing it on this Johnston and press delete, are you sure? We are. And like that, successfully deleted a company is built right out of the box simply by using, remember what? We have to go to the list of the companies. So that is list component. And then here, we're simply using the delete button provided to us by Refine that when you try to delete something, a pop-up shows and then it executes the use delete for our specified data provider. We didn't have to specify anything else, zero functions. We just provide the record item ID and make sure that the table gets its necessary props and define the resource right here within the use table. And that's it. It works right out of the box. With that said, our dashboard is now looking fantastic and with it also our companies. The dashboard just shows the data, whereas in the companies we have full CRUD functionalities such as list where we can see all of them, create them, update them, and delete them. With that said, let's navigate to our next big page in this dashboard, which is tasks. And inside of here, we're going to implement a complete Kanban board. Yep. I'm talking full apps like Trello or Jira right here within our dashboard. That's going to be quite exciting. So let's collapse our browser, close all of the currently open files and start by creating the route for the tasks. We can do that by going to our app.tsx, create a new parent route like we did for the companies where we can define the path equal to forward slash tasks. And then within it, we can create a new index route that's going to render not the company list, but rather the tasks list. So let's create a new page right here, or rather a new folder within pages called tasks. And within it, we can create a new file called list.tsx run RAFCE, call it a list and import it right here. That's going to be list coming from pages, tasks, list. We have an empty slate inside of which we can start creating our list. To get started with our list, we can first wrap everything in an empty React fragment. And then right within it, we need to wrap everything in a Kanban board container that's gonna look something like this. Of course, this will temporarily break our app as we don't yet have this component. And right within it, we need to create a new Kanban column, just like so. These are the two primary components which will form our Kanban board. So let's create the first one by going to our components folder. And right within it, we can create a new tasks folder. And within the task, we can create another folder called Kanban and within Kanban, we can create a new file called board.tsx. Within there, we can run RAFCE and we can rename it to Kanban board container. There we go. That's one. 
Now, when it comes to the board and the container itself, there's gonna be two things. So we don't wanna do an export default here. Rather, we wanna export just the Kanban board container, but also export const Kanban board. So we're gonna have a board as well as the container as two separate exports from this file. So let's also export this one. There we go. And for now, we can put a return with just a div that's going to say board. There we go. And we can also create another file right here within tasks, still within Kanban, which is going to be a column.tsx where we can run refce and just call it Kanban column. There we go. Now we can go back into the list and we can import all of these components, Kanban board container, as well as a Kanban board coming from this file. And we can also import the Kanban column from the column folder. There we go. So this is the structure. We have the Kanban board container. Within it, we're gonna create a Kanban board. And then within the board, we're gonna have multiple columns. So let's just nicely space this out. This is one column and we can duplicate it to signify that there's gonna be another column as well. Great, I hope this makes sense. And right now you can see that it's complaining because it accepts some children property, which we have to specifically define within those components. So let's get started with the Kanban board container and the Kanban board itself. The Kanban board container will of course accept children as the only prop and it can be of a type react.props with children. Here, we have to wrap everything in a div with some specific styles, so we can define a style, and those styles we're gonna define later. We can have another div within this div that's also going to have some additional styles, which we're gonna define later, but the most important part is that within those divs, we can render children. This now allows us to show the board within the Kanban board container, which is just going to provide the styling. For this entire Kanban, we'll use something known as a DND kit. It's a drag and drop feature. It's lightweight, performant, and accessible, and just allows us to drag and drop different stuff. Of course, we need this for our Kanban. You can see exactly how they're doing it here, something similar to what we are going to do with our Kanban board. So with that said, let's simply install it by copying this command and paste it, npm install at dnd-kit forward slash core, and we can paste it. Now, as soon as it gets installed, we can use it right here within our Kanban board. We can do it by wrapping everything within a dnd context imported from dnd kit. And of course, we can close it at the end. And here, we're gonna also return children which are gonna come right here from props, children. And there we can also say this is a react.props with children. There we go. So now we're wrapping the DND context and we have the children right here. And we're also exporting the board container. So now if we go back, you can see that we have two Kanban columns because both the board container as well as the board simply return what is in there, which in this case are the children. So let's start by applying some styles to our Kanban board container. The outer div is gonna have a width of about, we can use calc to calculate it, and we can do 100% plus 64 pixels. This will give us some space to work with. We can also have a height equal to, that's also going to be calc, and that's going to be 100VH minus 64 pixels. I believe that's the height of our navbar. Display will be set to flex. Justify content will be set to column. And margin will be set to minus 32 pixels. Now within the outer div, we can give it a width of 100%. We can also give it a height of 100% as well. We can give it a display of flex, a padding of about 32 pixels, and the overflow of scroll. There we go. I know this is not much, but we're just starting to create the outer structure. Remember, this is the structure we're going for. We can add new cars and everything fits nicely within this window. So finally, let's go back to our list. So now let's start focusing on the inner structure of the Kanban board by creating our Kanban columns. We can first wrap everything in a div. 
And this div later on will also have a reference. So we can say ref is equal to, and this reference will be coming directly from DND core. So right at the top, we can say const, we can destructure the is over property, which is a Boolean indicating whether a draggable element is currently hovering over the target. Then we're going to also have the set node ref, which is a function to pass to the ref prop of the element you want to make droppable. And finally, we have the active property, which is an object containing information about the draggable item that is currently being dragged. So we get all of this when we make it equal to use droppable coming from DND kit core. We also have to provide it an options object with the ID as well as data. For now, we can leave those two things as they are. And now we can use the set node ref and pass it to this div right here. Great. Now let's apply additional styles to this div by giving it a display is equal to flex, a flex direction equal to column, and a padding of zero and 16 pixels on left and right. Within this div, we can create another div. For now, we're just creating the structure that's going to have the style equal to padding of 12 pixels on all sides. Within it, we can create a space property just to, of course, provide some space. This has to be imported from add design. And this space can have a style of width is 100%. And it will also have a justify content of space between. There we go. Now within this space, we're going to have another space. And this space will render a text element. This text we already know, it's a component for rendering all kinds of text. And for now, this text can render the title of a specific to do. So it's going to be title to do. And already we can see the columns that we're creating. We have two of these as I have rendered two columns in this list. Let's style a bit this text by giving it the ellipsis property equal to tooltip of the title we're trying to render. So title to do. So in this case, if the task is very, very long, if you hover over it, you can see a full one. And right here, you can just see the base one that's shorter and easier for us to show. We're going to make this dynamic later on. Next, we also want to increase the size. So let's put this in a new line ellipsis as well. And we can say size is equal to XS. It's also going to be strong. And we can give it an additional style of text transform of uppercase, as well as a white space, no wrap. That's exactly what we want to do. There we go. Now let's see what else does each task has to have. Here, we're just creating the to do and then the batch of the tasks within that board. So we have to do three, and we have to create this badge right now. So going back, let's provide that badge right here below the text. And we can do that by saying if exclamation mark, exclamation mark, count. So we convert the count from a number to a Boolean. And if it exists, then render the batch component coming from and D like this and pass to it a count is equal to count. Of course, the count is undefined now. So right here at the top, we can define the count equal to something like zero right now, in which case it doesn't appear. But if it's two, you can see that we get two right here. That's looking good to me. You can also define a color within this badge. So let's do something like color is cyan. There we go. That's more like it. Now below this space right here, we can render a button coming from add D. And this button will be self closing, it's going to have a shape equal to circle, it's going to have an icon equal to, let's do a plus outlined, we're going to use this to add new to do's to that specific column. And on click, we want to render a function called on add click handler, which of course, we have to define right here at the top. For now, we can say const on add click handler is a basic arrow function. There we go. Now we have pluses right here looking good. Finally, below this space right here, we can render a description, which is also going to be a real variable. So let's make it dynamic immediately, as well as the title, 
just to mark all of these details, Khan's description is equal to, let's do something like description. We can also mark the title. Khan's title is equal to title. That way, instead of just saying title here, we can use the real title, which we're gonna later on make dynamic. And we can do a similar thing right here. And right below the space, we can render the description. There we go. This is looking good. Now, below this div containing the description, still within the other div, we want to create a new div. And this div will have a few styles, starting with the flex property of 1. Overflow, y, is going to depend on whether this field is currently active. So we can say if active. And I believe we're getting this value from the draggable or the droppable. Yep, that's the case. If it's currently active, then we want to change the overflow to unset. Usually, it's going to be set to auto. Similarly, we can also play with the color or the border. So we can say border is a two pixel dashed transparent. And of course, that's supposed to be border. And also, we can change the border color. If the drag is over, in that case, we can give it a color of 0, 0, 0, 0, 040. Else, we can do transparent. So now if we save it, you can see those just small lines right here, nothing noticeable right now. And we can also give it a border radius of something like 4 pixels. Finally, let's style the last div within this div. And this one will also have a style equal to margin top of about 12 pixels. It will have a display equal to flex, a flex direction equal to column, and a gap of 8 pixels. And let's make this a string. And right within here, we want to render children. Yep, the Kanban column will also have the children, which are going to be the actual elements. So we can get it right here at the top, coming into the component, children. And we can define this as react.propswithchildren. Now, if we save it, nothing much is going to change. But now our column is almost done when it comes to the layout, and we are ready to pass some things into it. And of course, the thing we're going to pass within it is going to be a Kanban item. It's going to look like so. And this item we can also create by going to Components, Tasks, Kanban, and then item.tsx, run RAFCE, call it a Kanban item. And then right here, we can import it from Components, Tasks, Kanban item, and dive into it to start developing it. Keep in mind that in the list, or rather in the column right here, we had the Use Droppable which you use for the container, you want to drop the items within. But then for our item, we're going to use another hook coming from drag and drop. And that's going to be use draggable because item is the one you drag and drop into the droppable zone. So right here, we can say const, and then we can get access to the attributes. Attributes is an object containing everything that we should use to spread on the item to make it draggable. We also have listeners, which is an object containing event handlers to apply to this element. We have the set node ref, which is similar. It's just a reference to the node. We have the active, contains the information about the item currently being dragged. And we simply call the function use draggable, coming from DND core. To it, we have to pass the ID, which is the unique identifier of the item we're dragging. We're going to do that later on as well as the data. And now, as before, we can start creating the structure for this Kanban item by wrapping everything in a div that has a style equal to position is relative. Within it, we can have a div that's going to act as the primary node. So we can give it a ref equal to set node ref. We can then spread all of the attributes as well as all of the listeners. This is how you use the DND kit. We can also give it some styles, and those styles can be modified depending on what are we currently doing with the item. Is it sitting idle? 
or are we drag and dropping it? So let's give it an opacity that's going to depend on the active state. And if active.id is triple equal to the ID we're working with, that we're going to get through props. So we might do that as well immediately. We get children, we get ID, and we get the data through props. So let's also define the types of react.props with children. But this one also has some additional props alongside children, which allows you to define them like this. Props with children, and then you specify props as well, which we can define right here. Interface, props, and interface is just a different way of defining a type. We have an ID of type string, and we have data, which is optional, and it's of a type use draggable arguments that we pass data to. This is provided to us by DND Kit Core. So now we have the ID and the props as well. And if that is the item we're currently dragging, the opacity is going to be 1, else it's going to be 0 0.5. Else it's going to be 1 right here as well. Next, we want to have a border radius of about 8 pixels. We want to give it a position of relative. And we want to give it a cursor of grab. This definitely isn't one that you use often, but it's perfect for this use case. So now you cannot see it because nothing's there, but soon enough you will. Within this div, we want to create an optional piece of code depending of if this is the item we're currently dragging. So we can say if active question mark dot ID is triple equal to the ID we're on. In that case, we want to render this. We want to render the drag overlay, and that's coming directly from DND core. We need to pass it a Z index of 1000. That's because and design cider has an index of 999. Within it, we can render a div, and that div is going to have a style equal to border radius of about 8 pixels, and we also want to provide it a box shadow. And now we can really play with this box shadow. Just by Googling a box shadow generator, it can give you some nice box shadows, and you can even modify them around. So if we go here and modify it, you can notice how it changes. In this case, we want to have some simple box shadow for card. And we have plenty on the internet as well. We want to use something very simple. There we go. You can choose one here. I like this one. Or this one is also cool. So you just click it. It's going to copy some box shadow styles. And you can simply paste it right here. We don't even need this part. There we go. Box shadow. You put this in a string and make sure that it says box shadow like so. And also the cursor right here is going to be set to grabbing. There we go. So now if we go back, we cannot see anything and that's because we aren't rendering the children. So now we want to show anything that we pass into this item right here as that item. So if we go back here, Kanban item, we can now say this is my first to do and save it. Oh, it appears that we cannot yet actually see it. Why is that? Well, if we go to Kanban item, we can see that we are referencing to some kind of an ID that right now is just empty. So even though we're passing it, we're not really using it. And therefore, this is not going to match. So it will not show. But if we show the children right here, outside of this dynamic block of code, we can actually see this is my first to do. And it appears to be draggable, but it's not yet fully draggable. So everything we've done so far is great. But now, what do you say that we actually fetch some data from the database, real data using Refine that would form our tasks? And then we can distribute those tasks across all of the columns just like so. And only after we have the data, we can start focusing on creating this final piece of UI which is a card that shows the most important information about a specific to do at a glance. So let's focus on getting that data. We can do it by using our well-known use list by saying const data renamed as tasks is loading renamed as is loading tasks. 
and that is equal to use list hook call, which we can import from refine dev core. Now to it, we'll also have to pass the resource, which in this case will be tasks for our Kanban board and also the meta property to pass the GQL query for fetching that. And that's going to be just a simple tasks query. And if we look into it, you can provide some filtering, sorting and paging, and then we get back the total count of all tasks as well as ID, title, description, due date, and everything we need about that task, as well as the user details associated with that task. While we're here, we can also provide some additional sorting options, such as we want to apply a sorter or sorters where we want to sort tasks by due date in ascending order. So we can say field is due date and order is ascending order. Next, we want to disable pagination for this one. So we can say pagination is going to be mode off off. And that's it for now. Now let's see if we're getting any tasks back. We can console log tasks right here and we can open up an inspect element and then console to see an object that indeed has 16 tasks right here, which is looking great. But it's not only about showing tasks. We have to know where to show these tasks. We have to group them by columns and we can call these columns stages. This is the unassigned stage, the to do stage in progress in review and more. So first we have to map over all of these stages and then map over the tasks within each stage. So for now, I'm going to collapse this list right here and I will create a new list on top of it. Const data where we rename it to stages is loading is is loading stages and we call it as a regular use list. In this case, the resource is going to be task stages and we can also apply a meta property where we're going to add a GQL query of task underscore stages underscore query. And this one, what it does is applies filtering, sorting and paging and then returns the ID and the title of all the different stages. While we're here, we can also filter out the stages so we can say filters and we only want to get those where field title includes. So we can say operator in value, an array of to do in progress in review and done. So we only want to filter out those stages that have these values. We can also sort it out by applying sorters, which is an array of one sort that has a field of created ad, and it's going to be sorted by ascending for the created ad property. There we go. And of course, this right here has to be an array because we can have multiple sorters within it. And now we have the list that fetches the stages and right below it, we fetch the tasks. But there's one specific options that we can apply to it, which is query options. And here we can say enabled only if no, no stages. I like to say no, no for this one, but it's just a double exclamation mark, which turns whatever this is, which could be a list of records into a Boolean variable, meaning only fetch tasks when stages are fetched and they exist. So now we have two of these use lists, which are going to be incredibly useful in showing all the data. But of course, now we have to fuse the two. We want to group tasks by stages. So we can say const task stages is equal to, and we're going to even use a react.memo or rather use memo to memoize the result of this. We don't use the use memo too often, and you might not have used it at all ever, but it's incredibly useful in this case where we're going to memoize the result so that it's not recalculated on every render, but only when stages or tasks change. So right here we can add stages and tasks in this dependency array. This is going to optimize our application further. Then we want to check if stages or tasks are not present. And if they're not, we can return an empty array. 
by checking if no tasks question mark dot data or no stages question mark dot data. Then we want to return an object that is going to say unassigned stage is an empty array and stages is also an empty array. Then if we do have tasks, we want to prepare unassigned stage tasks. The unassigned ones are these ones right here on the first line. And I can notice that our app is broken now. And that's because we didn't import react from react. There we go. We're back. So if we do have the tasks, let's say const unassigned stage is equal to tasks.data.filter where we get a task and then check if the task.stage ID is equal to null. So only if it's null, then we know that it is a task belonging to unassigned stage. Finally, we want to group those tasks together by creating const grouped, which is going to be of a type task stage coming from GraphQL schemas array, which is equal to stages dot data dot map, where we get each individual stage and then automatically return this, the spread of the stage. And once again, with the automatic return, make sure to put parenthesis here and then an object we're returning. Then we want to spread all of the tasks dot data dot filter, where we get each individual task and we filter out the ones task dot stage ID dot to string is triple equal to stage dot ID. Finally, we want to return unassigned stage as well as columns, which are going to be grouped. And don't worry about this warning right here. We're going to look into that very soon. But the most important thing right now is that we have our task stages. We can use that directly within our Kanban column. So let's pass a couple of props to it. Let's pass the ID. And this one is going to be just static. It's always going to be unassigned. The title is also going to be unassigned. The count of the tasks is going to be task stages dot unassigned stage dot length, or we can define it as zero. And we also want to add the on add click. So if we want to add the item to this specific stage, in that case, we can call a callback function with the handle add card function. And this function we have to define right here at the top const handle add card to that specific stage. And it's going to accept a property of an object that has a stage ID in this case equal to an assigned. Of course, we have to define that stage right here by defining the arguments as an object with stage ID is of a type string. Great. Now you can notice that our Kanban column is complaining because in it, we didn't yet define any props that it's getting besides children. So now might be the best time to do it. Let's put this in a new line and let's define all of these new props that it will now be getting such as the ID title description count and data. We can do it like so. And we also need to provide additional props of types to this Kanban column now by defining a type of props or an interface either way with an ID of a type string with a title of a type string with a description, which is going to be optional of a type react dot react node of the count, which is going to be of a type number data which is going to be optional and it will be a use droppable arguments of data coming from D and D kit and on add click, which is a function that accepts args, which are simply an ID of a type string. And this function doesn't return anything. So we can say void. So after the data, we can also add the on add click. Now let's put these props to use right here. We can, specify a real ID by saying ID is ID coming from the props and data is equal to data coming from the props as well. So we can put even this in one line 
Then we need to fix this typo right here by adding a colon right here. Similarly, I have defined the title already somewhere. Oh, there we go. Now we don't need these fake ones. We're just using the ones coming from the props. So if I do this and save it, that's already much better. Now it knows that we have some kind of a droppable zone. And on add click handler, here we can simply call the on add click function and then call it optionally with the ID property provided, like so. And with that, our column is now done and we're passing all of the proper fields to it. But of course, we're now rendering just a single unassigned column and we're not yet displaying any tasks. We just have this fake Kanban item right here. So what do you say that they delete this fake Kanban item and this fake second column and just focus on displaying real data within our unassigned column? We can do that by showing the list of tasks in the unassigned stage by saying task stages dot unassigned stage dot map where we get each individual task and for each one we return a can ban item like so this can ban item needs to accept a key because we're mapping over it of task id the id that's going to be task that id and finally it also needs to accept data that's going to be an object where we spread the task and provided a stage ID of unassigned. And there we could return something like task.title, at least for now. So if I save this, we cannot see anything yet, but let's quickly dive into the Kanban item and let's make use of the props we're passing to it, such as specifying the ID of the type ID coming through props and similar thing for the data. Now we're passing everything properly but it looks like it's complaining a bit about this ID being passed. It's saying that base key or undefined is not assignable to type string. That's because maybe it doesn't know what this task is. We're sure that it has an ID and we can easily fix this by providing a specific type to the documents coming back from our list. So for our first list, we can define a type of task stage like this. And for the second one, we can define a type of get fields from list and then expand it with the tasks query like this. Now, if we save it, it looks like adding this unassigned task actually broke the app. And I think that's because in our Kanban item, when using the two string, and if we open up the inspect element and then the console right here, we can see that it's complaining about reading the to string property in the list. So if I go back to the list, if, if I find this to string, looks like we definitely have to provide a question mark right here so it doesn't break. There we go. So now it knows that there is one unassigned task. So now that we have added that, it works, we can see one, but why are we not seeing anything being shown right here in our column? Well, now that we're actually getting back the data and we can see this badge, what do you say that we start focusing on creating this great looking task card? And to do it, we can go to our components, tasks, Kanban, and then create a new card.tsx where we can run a new RAFCE and call it project card. Now we can go back here and instead of just rendering the title, we can render the full project card component like so. It will be a self-closing component, but to it, we can pass some exciting stuff, such as we can spread the entire task data we wanna render, as well as give it a due date equal to task.dueDate or undefined. So now we can dive into this project card, accept all of these props and make it show on our screen. We have passed a few props, such as the ID, the title, the due date, and some cards might even have users, but the unassigned definitely won't have any, but it's good to define them up front. And these are gonna be the project card props. And we can immediately just define that type right here at the top, type project card props, which is going to have an ID of string so we can define it like this, a title of string as well, updated at of string, 
due date, which can be optional. So let's do due date, optional of type string. Let's then add the users, which is optional because unassigned doesn't have users. They're gonna have ID of string, name of string, and avatar URL, which is optional, which is going to be a user coming from GraphQL schema types, avatar URL type, and we can have an array of users because we're gonna support multiple. So with this in mind, we're now accepting all of these props and we can try to render a card. But how can we start rendering it if we cannot even see this div with a simple text? Well, let's dive into the Kanban item for a sec and let's try to render the children outside of this active ID. If I save it, you can see that still nothing is showing even though there should be one task at least but how can we even start creating the structure of the card if we cannot see even a simple text of project card? I think this task that I created disappeared or somebody else assigned it somewhere else. So I'm just gonna do that once again. And you'll also have access to this link to the deployed website either in the description or in the readme. So you'll be able to add it here in the finished version and it should automatically appear for you here as well. So now if we go to our list, and in the Kanban item, we can try rendering the children right below this check and then show it here. That way you'll be able to see the project card. And this is exactly how I wanna leave it for now, just so we can see what we're doing. There we go, now we can even kind of drag and drop it and the draggable area works as well, although we don't have any other columns. So now if we go back to our project card, we can start developing it. We're gonna use a very interesting component coming from Ant Design called Config Provider. This will allow us to make some modifications to the way we're showing the card, changing the theme, such as colors and more. So let's give it a theme, which is equal to components, inside of which we have components, and we wanna modify the tag by giving it a color text of, and now bear with me, we wanna define a token. These are design tokens coming from hand design. We can do them right here above the return by saying const token is equal to theme dot use token, like so. But this theme, of course, has to be imported from at D. And then we can say something like token dot color text secondary. We can also modify the card by defining the header BG to be transparent. Now within this config provider, we can render our card, which we can import from Ant Design. There we go. Now we can see our card and it actually looks very nice when you can drag and drop it. This card will have a few props, such as a size of small. It will have a title equal to, we're gonna render a text property right here and this text will be coming from our components, it will render a title. If the title is too long, we can give it an ellipsis. So we can say ellipsis with a tooltip of title. So in case we cannot show it full, we're just gonna show it within a tooltip. Below our title, we can give it an on click property. And if we click on a specific tag, we wanna be able to edit it. So we can create a new edit function const edit, which for now can be just an empty callback function. And we'll be calling it right here on click edit. Later on, we're gonna also provide it some additional parameters. Then we also wanna give it some extra properties, which we can define like this extra, and we can give it a drop down like so coming from at D. It's going to have a trigger property equal to an array of click it will have a menu that it has to render with the items equal to drop down items. Now this is something that we have to define. So let's scroll a bit up and let's define const drop down items. We're gonna use the use memo coming from React as we don't wanna re-render them when we don't have to. And inside of it, we can define the drop down items const drop down items of a type menu props coming from and design 
specifically items right here, which is going to be equal to an array of those items that we want to provide. Of course, let's ensure that we have imported use memo. And let's also give it a dependency array that is empty. Now these items are going to look like this, we're going to have two. The first one will have a label of view card. So of course, we can open up the full card, it can have a key of one, and an icon of I outlined like this, which is of course, just a simple icon from and design icons. It will also have an on click property that will allow us to call a callback function where we can edit those tasks. And of course, we're going to provide additional properties to the edit later on. Then we can render the second one where the danger is set to true. So this is a red one with a label of the lead card, a key of a string of two, and then on click where we can later on delete that card. So that looks like this. And of course, it's not an object, rather, it's just a function call. There we go. So now if we save it, we can see that we're almost there. But we're not yet returning the items. So we can return the drop down items, and that's going to memoize them. Now we do have an error. So if we inspect it and go to console, we can see that the error happens right here. React children can only receive one child element. This could be happening due to drop downs. Maybe it's because we haven't provided any buttons or anything within the drop down. So let's try to provide a single button, which can be imported from add design. And this fixes it. There we go. Button right here, which will act as the drop down. This right here is what we're creating this drop down that allows you to view and delete a card. So this button will be a simple self closing button, because we can provide everything as props, it will have a type equal to text, a shape equal to circle. And most importantly, an icon, that's going to be more outlined, more outlined like this. And we of course have to import it from add design icons. So let's do that right away. And we can give it a style of transform, where we can rotate it 90 degrees. And that's going to look like this. Also, if we click this, we don't want to click at the card at the same time to drag and drop it, which is an interesting lesson on its own, we can give it a property of on pointer down. And here we get the event, the click event, and we can stop the propagation. So E dot stop propagation. So once we point it down, nothing else is going to happen. The only thing that will is we're going to click this button. Similarly, on click, we want to do the same thing. So on click, stop propagation. And of course, we have to close this one right here, and this one right here. And I believe this one is extra. There we go. So now when I click it, it will just open up this thing right here and nothing else. It won't try to drag and drop a card. Also, I think we're missing an icon for delete card. So let's scroll a bit up. And here in the drop down items, below the key, we can give it an icon of delete outlined, which we can import and render right here. Of course, we have to add a comma after it. There we go. This is more like it. So now our card is starting to look great. Here below the menu, we can also define the placement of where it will open, which will be bottom. And we can define the arrow of point at center of true. So now if we go here, click it, it's going to open it right below this card. Next, right where we end the drop down, and we can also close it. So it's easier to see, we go within the card itself. And in the card, we want to render a div. This div will have a style property equal to display of flex. We also want to give it a flex wrap of wrap, just a single P there. We also want to give it an align items of center, 
as well as a gap of eight pixels to create some space. Now, right within this div, we wanna render a special SVG, which is going to be just this little icon with these three lines right here. So what we can do is go to source and then components and create a new file called text-icon.tsx where we can run RAFCE, rename it to text icon in Pascal case. And as a matter of fact, this entire file will be provided for you in the readme down below. Just search for text icon and paste it. The reason why I provided it to you is because it's a single SVG, which we simply export as the icon component. So now going back, we can import text icon coming from components text icon. We can self close it and we can give it a style of margin right of about four pixels to create the space for the text that's coming after. This little icon is what we have done right now. Now, right next to this icon, we wanna show whether we have a deadline. Here, we're gonna play a lot with the colors of this due soon. Whereas if it's coming soon, it's gonna be yellow. Else, if we still have some time, it's just gonna be regular black. So right next to this text icon, or rather just below it, let's check if we have something known as due date options. This is a variable or an object that we will create that will help us figure out which colors we wanna add. So we can say const due date options, which we can memoize. So we can say use memo and we can change the memo if only the due date changes like this, of course, within the dependency array. Here, we can check if we don't have a due date, then we can return null. Else, if we have a date, we can wrap it in a day.js instance like this. And then we can return an object containing the color by calling the get date color from utilities and passing an object including our current due date as string for TypeScript and a text of date dot format MMMDD. Now, based off of these due date options, we can render our tag, which is going to look like this. It is a single tag, which can be imported from AMP design, of course. And we're going to give it an icon. This icon is going to be just a simple clock circle outlined. And if we save it and import it, let's see. Yep, it is imported, but we don't see it yet. It's possible that's because this task doesn't have any due dates. So if we go to the finished website and apply a due date here to this task, like 18th, there we go, it got added. So now in the current version, we can actually see the clock. So you can also go to the deployed website and play with the database there, considering we don't yet have the functionality to modify these pieces of data. This icon can have a style of font size of 12 pixels. We can also style the tag further right here by giving it a style of padding, something like let's do zero and four pixels on left and right. Let's give it a margin inline end of zero. So we don't wanna have any end margin. And most importantly, let's change the background color by checking the due date options that color. If it's default like this default, then we wanna give it transparent else we wanna set it as unset because it's gonna be set by the options themselves. Then below the styles, we can modify the color to be equal to due date options that color. And we can modify the bordered to be equal to due date options dot color if it's not equal to default. So if it's not, it will be bordered, else it will. So if it has a color, it will have a border, else it won't have one, like we have done right here. And within the tag, we can simply render the due date options dot text. There we go, this is more like it. Let's also modify this test to say something more interesting, like finalize Kanban board. That's more like it. 
So if we go back, again, the real-time functionality works wonderfully and we are getting there. Now, right next to this, on the right side, we wanna show our users like this. So let's go below our tag, still within this div. And let's say if no, no users, question mark dot length. So in this case, we're checking if there are any users. And if there are, we can render a space to just provide some extra spacing coming from ant D. And within it, we can map over the users. So we can say users dot map where we get a specific user. And for each one, we return a tooltip or we wrap rather with a tooltip, which we have to import from ant D. But what do we wrap? Well, we wrap a custom avatar component, which we have created before. This custom avatar accepts a name of user.name as well as a source of user.avatar URL. So now if we save it, we still cannot see anything because we don't have any users for this task. But if I go here and I add some, for example, let's add Michael Scott and save. There we go. You can see it right here. Now let's also modify this tooltip by giving it a key since we're mapping over it of user.id and a title of user.name. So now if we hover over it, you can see Michael Scott and let's put it to the right side by styling this space with a size of four, a wrap property, direction is going to be set to horizontal, align will be set to center and style will be of display flex. Justify content will be set to flex end. Margin left will be set to auto and margin right will be set to zero. And that's going to move it to the right side. And that my people is your card, a more complicated card that later on will allow us to do all sorts of great things and show it in many different places. We're not developing just one card. We're developing hundreds of them. We're just going to reuse them across all the different stages. Now, since we'll be showing so many cards, it's important to memoize the card to render only on certain conditions. If all of the props of the project card component are the same as in the previous rendered, then the project card component should not be re-rendered. This is very useful when the parent component is re-rendered, but the props of the project card components are not changed. So let me show you how to memoize a component. We can do that right here at the bottom by saying export const project card memo is equal to memo, which we can import from react. We pass the project card to it. And then we pass a callback function of prev and next. These are the previous and next props that we pass to our component. And then we can return the change of these props. So we need to compare them. If prev that ID is triple equal to the next ID and prev that title is equal to the next title and prev that due date is equal to next due date and prev that users, we can look into the length of the user is equal to next.users.length. And finally, we can look into the updated ad. So prev dot updated ad is triple equal to next dot updated ad. If that is the case, then we're going to show a new card. If that is not the case, meaning if something like this changed, then we're going to show a new card else. We're going to always show the memoized version of the card, which is going to make our Kanban so much more optimized because we don't want to do the unnecessary re-renders of all of these cards when their parent elements change, but if they haven't changed themselves. So with that said, going back to the list, we can now use the project card memo instead of the regular project card. It works exactly the same, but it's more optimized. So with that said, what do you say that we show so many more cards and stages at this point, now that our card has been fully developed, let's do it just after we add this plus button, or we can even add this add new card if we absolutely have no cards under unassigned. So let's go below this Kanban item and right here below these three parentheses. 
and we can say if no task stages dot unassigned stage dot length, then we can display the Kanban add card button, which we don't have yet, but we'll create soon. And it will accept the on click, which is going to have a callback function of handle add card with a stage ID of unassigned. Let's see if this is how we should be doing that. Yep, stage ID, in this case, unassigned. So now let's create this Kanban add card button by going to components, tasks, Kanban, and then we can call it add-card-button.tsx. We can run RAFCE, rename it to Kanban add card button. And you can find the code for this one in the readme down below as it's just a simple button, nothing special happening here. So simply copy it and then paste it and then going back, import it from components. This will bring us back to where we were, but it looks like it's not loading. So let's go back to our Kanban add card and let's make sure that the text is imported from the right place. So right here, you can import text from components text and that should be good. Now, if you reload and go back to tasks, you can see the add new card button, which later on we're gonna make work. But for now, don't forget what our main mission is. And that is to show all of the cards across all of the stages. So to do that, we can exit our first Kanban column, render the rest of the columns by rendering task stages dot columns dot map. We can add a question mark here to ensure we have them. And then for each column, we can render, can you guess what? A Kanban column component right here. And we can pass to it a key since we're mapping over it of column.id. We can pass to it the ID of column ID. We can give it a title of column title, a count of column.tasks.length, and we can give it on add click, which is going to handle add card by stage ID of column.id. If you save it, you can now see all of the columns appear right here with the respective numbers of tasks within each column. Now within it, we wanna check if we're loading. So for that, we can check right here at the top by saying const is loading is equal to either is loading stages or is loading tasks. And then if is loading, we can render the page skeleton, which is going to look like this, return page skeleton. And this page skeleton, we can define right here at the bottom below the export, where we can say const page skeleton is equal to, it's just going to be a typical React function, where we can define the column count to something like six, and the item count as well, or the card count, which is going to be equal to four. Then we can return everything as we usually would with our Kanban, a Kanban board container. And inside of it, we can mock all of the stages as well as the cards. So array dot from, we can mock the length based off of the column length or the column count. And then we can immediately map over it again where we get each individual index of the card within the column. So we can get the index and for each index, we return a Kanban column skeleton like this with a key equal to index. And within it, we once again take the array dot from, but this time length is the item count or the card count instead of the count of columns we map over it, again get the index, and immediately return a project card skeleton coming from components to which we can provide a key of index. And we don't have to say return here because I use the automatic return right here or the immediate return with a parenthesis. Now, if you reload, 
you saw for a split second that we had this nice loading. If your internet connection was slower, you would be able to see how they nicely load both the columns and the items within the columns. So now let's go within the second Kanban column or rather within all of the columns we'll have in the future. And we can say if not is loading, then we can map over the tasks within that column by calling the column.tasks.map where we get each individual task and for each one we return a Kanban item like this. This Kanban item will render a project card memo the same way that it did before. So let's render a project card memo where we spread the task and render the due date. And the Kanban item will also have a key of item.id since we're looping over it, or in this case, task.id, and the ID of task.id as well, and the data for each task of task. And I do think we have a couple of these too many. So if we fix it, we immediately get all of the tasks back, which is exactly what we wanted this entire time. This is amazing. All of the tasks from our database that we can see here on the deployed version are also now right here in our existing application. And the drag and drop is almost working. You can see that you can notice once you actually pick it up and it's gonna notice the draggable zone once you move it over, which is amazing. But for now, it doesn't do it quite yet. We're gonna implement that very soon. But the most important part is that we're officially fetching the data for the tasks and displaying it within the columns. Now, if a column doesn't have any tasks, we wanna show similar thing that we showed in the unassigned. So let's copy this Kanban add card button and go a bit below, below the is loading, and then say if no column dot tasks dot length, in that case, we just wanna return a Kanban add card button, and the stage is going to be a column dot ID. So now if we don't have it, you'll be able to add it within the one that doesn't have any tasks. And finally, this task list page also will accept children. Yep, the list will accept the children as well. And we can define the type of react.prop with children. And what will those children be? Well, let me tell you about it. We're gonna put it right here below the Kanban. So it's outside of the entire board, but it's gonna show on top of the screen. So it's a modal, any kind of modal that will show once we do any action, like this action right here or this one right here. So it's the additional functionalities to our Kanban board. Now with that said, let's figure out why do we have these lines right here, whereas in the finished website, there's no lines in between the columns. And let's figure out those small inconsistencies that we have before we can actually start moving the data across and syncing it with the real database. Our issue will most likely be within the Kanban column. So if we go right here and go to our div, there we go, this is the div wrapping it. We can see that I set scroll right here for overflow Y and this does seem like a scrolling div or like a scrolling container. So instead of scroll, I'm gonna make it auto. And by itself, that automatically fixes the issue. So now that the UI part is done, let's go ahead and expand our browser and admire our work in its full glory. We have our dashboard, we have the companies, the tasks, and hey, you can actually drag and drop stuff around. It's not easy to do drag and drop features, but D&D Kit or Drag and Drop Kit definitely helped us. Although we're not quite there yet, we're not fully finished. Even though the UI UX for the list is done, now we have to implement the functionality of once we actually drop it for it to stay there and to update in the database. And we have to do the modals for the add a new car, as well as to show our task details once we actually click on it. So let's first make it so that once we drag and drop it, it actually stays there. To do that, we can figure out where the drag and dropping functionality is actually happening. In the card, we have this part right here where we have clicks. This is only for this little thing. Once we click on it, the view and delete, we can deal with those later. 
But for now, the most important part is moving it between different elements. And to do that, we can go back to the list. And in the list, we can create a special function called const handle on drag end, meaning what's going to happen after we finish the drag and drop. And here we're going to get the event and we can define the event as drag and event coming from DND core. There we go. Now let's figure out what goes into this function. This function will update task stage when the task is drag and dropped. So first we have to figure out the stage ID of the task on which the task is dropped. We can do that by saying let stage ID is equal to event dot over question mark dot ID as undefined or string or null. We have to do this types tango right here just to ensure that TypeScript is good to us. And then we can also get the task ID of the task that is being dragged. So we can say const task ID is equal to event.active.id as string. Then we can get the stage ID of the task that is being dragged. So we can say const task stage ID is equal to event.active.data.current question mark dot stage ID. So we know where it's going to. Then if the task stage ID is triple equal to the stage ID, we simply exit out of the function because nothing happened. Else, if stage ID is equal to unassigned, then we're going to modify the stage ID to be equal to null because that's how it works for unassigned stages or unassigned tasks. And finally, if we actually want to move it, we're going to use another refine function called update task, or in this case, use update, which is going to perform a mutation. So we can do this right at the top. We can define a new hook const. It's going to give us access to the mutate function, which we can rename as update task, because that is the specific mutation we're doing. And then we can make a hook call to use update. That's coming from refine dev core and we just call it as a function. That's it. It will automatically provide you a specific mutation function, which we renamed to as update task. That's going to do everything we need it to do. So right here within our handle on drag end, we can now call the update task and provide it an object of options. First of all, the resource we're talking about or moving in this case tasks then specify the ID of the record that should be updated. So we can say ID of task ID, then specify the values that should be updated. And the values is going to be the stage ID. So we are updating the stage ID to stage ID of the ID that we are moving or of the task that we are moving. I hope that makes sense. Then in this case, we can disable the success notification by saying just false because it's a simple drag and drop. And then mutation mode, as we discussed before, in this case can be set to optimistic. That's interesting. Before we used pessimistic, I believe here we can use an optimistic one. So let's say optimistic. And we're doing that to make our app seem more performant because then the change will happen automatically and it's going to move it before it actually updates it in the database, which is necessary for good user experience. But we're going to assume that the database update will happen as well, which it most likely will. Finally, since we're using GraphQL, we can provide the last property, which is the meta property, defining the specific GQL, not query, but rather GQL mutation of update underscore task underscore stage underscore mutation, which we of course have to import from GraphQL mutations. And let's quickly look into it. It simply takes the input, which are everything we need for a specific task. In this case, just the ID and it calls the update function and returns the updated ID. So we have the update task, which now will be happening at the end of the handle on drag end. So let's see where we can call our handle drag end. We're going to call it right here or not call it rather pass it to our Kanban board. So we can say on drag end is equal to handle on 
drag end. We can go into the Kanban board and right at the top alongside children, we can also accept on drag end. And we can also define the props right here by saying props. And we can say type props is equal to, it's gonna accept the on drag end function, which is going to look like this. It accepts an event, which is of a type drag event or drag end event. Thankfully, DND Kit Core provide that for us and it doesn't return anything, so it's void. Now, finally, we can use it or pass it right to our DND context. This is the most important component or wrapper or context, whatever you wish, that manages our entire drag and drop process. So right here, we can give it the on drag and property and we can pass the handle drag and function, which we are passing through props. So it's not on drag end. I believe it should be handle drag end. Let me look into that. Kanban. Oh, I passed it into the Kanban board container, whereas I should have been passing it into the Kanban board. Yep. You see that right here on drag end coming to Kanban board, not the container. So let's remove it from the Kanban container and just put it right here directly on the Kanban board. So if I scroll down, I'm going to define the type props right here, get it here on drag end. And now we can also define the props and we can simply call on drag end on the on drag end within the DND context. Great. Now, another thing we want to pass to our DND context to make it work flawlessly is something known as sensors. We can say sensors is equal to sensors. And now we have to define it at the top by using the sensors hook. Let me show you how that works right at the top of now we have to be careful. It's going to be Kanban board, not Kanban container. There we go. So right here we can say const mouse sensor is equal to use sensor coming from D and D kit core and to it, the first parameter is going to be the mouse sensor coming from D and D kit core. And then we can provide additional options in form of an object. The only option we want to provide right here, and don't worry that the app is breaking right now, we're going to fix it. We want to provide something known as an activation constraint with a distance of five. Now, what this does is it's a property that we can use to specify the condition under which a draggable item becomes active or in simple words, when are we actually dragging it? So this is five pixels, which is the minimal amount we need to drag it by to actually consider it as a drag. And we can do a similar thing with the touch sensor. If we are in mobile devices, keep in mind, we want to make our app fully mobile responsive. So let's also define the touch sensor which we can do right here below const touch sensor is equal to use sensor. In this case, we provide the touch sensor to it coming from DND kit core. And we also provide absolutely the same activation constraint. You can play with that a bit. You can also give it some delay or tolerance or just different things to make it work better on mobile devices. But in this case, I'm just going to provide it a, <laughs> I like how chat GPT filled this out as dinosaur. Uh, not sure why I did that. It's just the distance of five pixels right here. Now that we have our two sensors, mouse and touch sensor, we can simply provide them as sensors right here. Con sensors is equal to use sensors. And now we can pass all of them together, mouse sensor and touch sensor. And in this case, you notice that this is use sensor singular, but this one is the use sensors plural to which we pass already defined sensors. Now our drag and drop functionalities are going to be even more precise. So with that said, the sensors are done. The on drag end is done. So let's see what happens if I move one task from to do to in progress. And before I do that, I'm just going to make this a bit larger so we can see what's happening and drag and drop. There we go. 
it moved in real time. Now, just to ensure that it actually worked, let me reload the page. And you can see that it's still there. Let's try to move everything from to-do to in progress. Let's say we wanna have a really productive day today. You can see the label updates in real time, the tasks move in real time, and we can move everything so seamlessly between different things. This is amazing. Now, I noticed that if I try to move it to unassigned, I do have an error, invalid input syntax for type integer unassigned. This is an interesting one. It's coming from the on drag end function, which I think is in the list. So if we go here to update task, apparently it doesn't really like the null part. Let's see why that is. I just noticed that I passed two ends right here instead of one. So if I say unassigned like this, properly how it should be spelled, then it's gonna reset the stage ID to null, which should make it work with the unassigned column. So if I now move it, nope, it's still the same thing. Let me reload the page just to be sure. Unassigned, and if I move it, nope, still the same thing. We can still see that it's showing a double end right here. So let's copy it and let's search our code base for a double N. I paste it and it looks like I did call it unassigned with a double N a couple of times right here. And a quick Google search will immediately let me know that that's not the correct way to spell it. So going back, we might need to fix those. I mean, the variables are fine because we're just using them here, but if we're doing this properly, let's do it properly. I'm gonna fix the spelling in all cases, right here, unassigned, unassigned stage right here. And let's see, we have a couple more instances. This one is the most important one. We have the ID and then everywhere where we use the task stages, this has to be unassigned stage spelled properly. And also here on add click, this is important. The stage ID is unassigned. Let's also do it here. We could have done this automatically using control F, but this is good as well. Now, just one final instance, which is this unassigned and we are good. Now let's see what's gonna happen if we try to move it around to unassigned. We still get an unassigned integer right here, invalid input. So first of all, I think that when I was trying to modify it to have a single N, I mistakenly remove one S as well. So now let's use this automatic update to show you how I can easily change this. I'm going to turn on both the match case as well as match whole word, or no, we can, we can just use this one. And then I'm gonna modify the unassigned to include a double and then replace all instances right here. This should be good. So now everything says unassigned properly and immediately this fixed an issue on its own. We can now also move to unassigned as well as all of the other columns. This is great. And with that, our list is almost done. We can also click here and then view card, that's coming soon, or delete card, which is also coming soon. But what else do we have here with our list? Is there something else that we should be showing or doing? Well, while we're here, let's implement these two functionalities, the view card, and delete card. Those are going to be within our card. So let's go into our card. And right here under drop down items, remember that we didn't yet complete these functionalities, the edit or the on click on both of these. So let's first focus on the edit function that we have here. And edit will be coming directly from use navigation. It's a hook from Refine that allows us to navigate to a specific page and edit navigates to the edit page of that specified resource. It's so simple. So here we can say const, we can get the edit directly by using the use navigation hook, use navigation coming from not React Router DOM, but rather refine dev core. There we go. And now we can pass those additional things to the edit right here on the view card. Why are we using edit if you're viewing it? Well, that's because we're gonna both view it and edit it on the same modal. So right here, we can say edit tasks, provide the ID, which we wanna view or edit, and then say replace right here for the history type. 
because it's a modal, so we don't need to go back once you click back. This is it for the view card. And then for the delete, it's even easier. We can use a new hook, const mutate, which we can rename as delete. And that's gonna be equal to a call of use delete from refine dev core. There we go. And now we can simply call on click right here. We can call delete within this function block and we can pass it an object of resource is tasks ID to know which one we want to delete and the meta of operation is set to task. So it's an automatic operation to delete. But I just noticed that delete might not be the best name to call it because it's a predefined keyword of the JavaScript language. So I'm just gonna leave it as mutate right here and then call it mutate down below as well. There we go. So now if we try to delete, let's say implement security enhancements, we can click delete card and right off the bat, everything just works. This is what I like to see. I know it took some time to set up the foundations of everything and to set up the structure of the project. But now that everything just works seamlessly by simply calling a hook, it's pretty crazy to see it that way. Complete CRUD functionalities working right out of the box. Now the view is almost there, but not quite yet. It redirects to edit eight and we have to fix this within our router because soon enough we're gonna navigate to a different URL, but it will still be the same page because it's just a modal that's going to show on top of our list. And a pretty cool thing is that this details page of each task is at the same time the edit. Technically, you can think of this as a form where you change a couple of selects, to do's, and even some markdown, modify the due date, and change the people. You can also delete card there. So we're gonna do that very soon, but already I like what I'm seeing here. We can move it around and let's not forget before we move ahead to the details and edit. So right now on the deployed version, this is how it looks like a new form that has the title. And if we click here, nothing happens. So let's figure out where we have this add button. It should be under each column. So if we go to the column, and if I search for on add click handler, it looks like we do call this on add click handler, which is coming from our list. So we need to move to the list to be able to see what this function does. And now if we see the handle add card, which we're referring to right now, it's not doing absolutely anything. So let's make it do some work right here. What we can do is say const path is equal to, and we figure out where we need to redirect to. So to get this path, we can say args, which will include our stage ID. So we can say dot stage ID. If it's equal to unassigned like this, unassigned, then we want to point out to forward slash tasks forward slash new. But if it's not unassigned, then we want to point to forward slash tasks forward slash new with a query parameter of stage ID equal to, and we can make it a template string as well. So let's do that. And here we can feed it the args dot stage ID. Finally, we want to use replace coming from refine and react router Dom to modify the path. So going at the top right here, we can use a new hook const replace where we get it is equal to use navigation coming from refine dev core. And then we can use this replace to replace the path once we want to add a new card. So now if I go here and if I click new, it's going to point us to the task new. And at this point in time, neither the task new or the task edit and then a specific number exist. They are nowhere to be found. So what do you say that we closed all of our files and navigate over to app.tsx and implement the last two remaining routes of our application? It's actually going to be a bit different from what we had with the companies. Companies did have some routing and they did have additional pages for the edit. But here for the task, everything is going to be within one page. 
it's just the URL that's going to change. So we can define one route and we can automatically provide the element of list on that same route because it will be showing on all the routes. So right now that looks something like this route path of tasks, which renders the element of list. And now we can use a special component within it, which is called outlet. That looks something like this. This is not a refine feature. It's just a react router DOM feature and outlet allows us to render the child routes inside of the current route. But I just noticed that it didn't follow on the syntax correctly. If we're going to make this work, we have to actually expand the list to accept children elements, and then we can add outlet to it as a child. So let's put this in a new line like so. There we go. And now we put outlet here as a child. If you remember correctly, our list did in fact accept children and we are rendering them right here at the bottom. So what react router Dom will do now is it will figure out whatever we pass in this route and it will add it to the outlet. So how do we do that? Well, we can simply add two new routes route of a path new. Keep in mind, we're still within the parent route of tasks. So this is tasks new where we add a new element, which is equal to tasks create page. And this is something we'll have to create and we close it once again. Finally, we can duplicate it as well right below. And this is going to be edit forward slash and then ID. And this is going to be tasks edit page. There we go. So now let's create those two. We can do that by going to pages this time, then go to tasks and then create a create .tsx, run RAFCE and there simply call it create task and also create another one, which is going to be called edit .tsx, run RAFCE and call it edit task. Now go back within the app and rename these two create task and edit task and make sure to import them from pages, tasks, edit and pages, tasks, create. Now, if we save this, you're going to notice that even on tasks, edit, you'll still be able to see the list, but then we can show something else on that new page, such as there we go at the bottom, we can see edit task, but of course we don't want to show it on the bottom. We want to show it as a modal overlay, which we're going to do pretty soon. So for now, let's just expand this and look at that. We can see all the different columns. We can move stuff in real time and keep in mind, if you have somebody else working on this in real time, with you, they'll be able to see the changes live on their computer. We can move things around. We can even delete cards. We can create new cards, not yet, but soon. And it's all just working so seamlessly. We have the dashboard. Let's not forget what we have done there. We have the companies as well with complete edit functionalities with contacts. It's just looking so great. But now there's one last step and that is to make that details slash edit modal. And believe it or not, it doesn't do anything that we haven't yet done so far. This modal is going to be almost exactly the same as the form we have created for create a company or even more similar for the edit a company that we have right here. So what we can do is simply go right here to tasks. We can collapse our browser and move over to create task. Since we've already used all of the hooks, such as the navigation, use list and use modal form. I'm going to simply provide you the complete create task file, which you can find in the readme below. So copy it and paste it right here. And the only thing I'm going to do to it is I'm just going to make it from the named import or export to the default. So we can say export default tasks, create page. This might have been already done for you at the time of copying it. And now if you click plus right here, you can notice a new card appear. And if we type test and click save, it's just going to work right off the bat. 
But now, how do we add additional functionalities to this test, such as added a date, due date, assignees, and more? Well, let's move over to the edit task, which once again, uses absolutely the same hooks and functionalities you've used before in the create company or edit a company model. So in the readme down below, you can find the complete edit task file, copy it and paste it right here. Some of the most important details right here include the fact that we're using a modal and then passing all of the most important modal props coming from the use modal form exactly as we have done before. Now you can see that we also need a couple of components to make it work. And to get to those components, you can download the zipped form folder from the readme below, unzip it, and then paste it right here within your components and then tasks next to the Kanban. It should look something like this, where you get all of these right here. Since we copy them, we'll also have to modify our index.tsx or TS so we can automatically export them. So there, you can add something that looks like this. Export everything from dot slash tasks form description. And then we repeat that for due date, stage, title, users, and headers. And this will allow us to just import them all automatically within a single line, or in this case, multiple lines. And the last missing piece is the accordion. So going back right here, we need to also make sure to export that accordion by saying export everything from that's going to be dot slash, I believe accordion is right here in the components. So that's the last component that we need. Create one last file of accordion within components folder dot TSX, copy it from the readme down below and paste it right here. And finally in it, modify this text import by removing it and automatically importing it from dot slash text. So now if we go back, all of the exports are good. All of the imports within the edit are good. And if we reload, we would have hoped something would have worked. But in this case, it looks like we have an error regarding our MD editor. The MD editor stands for markdown editor. And that's happening in our description .tsx where we're trying to import this component, which will allow us to modify the markdown description of our tasks. Of course, to make it work, we just have to install this package. So open up the terminal, type npm install, and then you can paste that. Add UIW forward slash react dash MD dash editor. As soon as it is installed, the error should be gone. So let's reload the page open up the console or the inspect. And it looks like we have an uncaught error with an export of text, which is happening in the title. So if we go to our title, yeah, it's always that text. So it might be just a good idea to properly export it from here. I'm going to say export everything from dot slash text. And then we can do it like this. That way it should actually be within the components. So now it can find it either way. So if I reload this, now the text is good, but it's having trouble finding the user tag as well. So let's look into our index and we might need to export the user tag as well by running export everything from, and here we can say dot slash tags forward slash user dash tag. And this is the last component, I believe, which we haven't yet created. So let's go to our components tags and create a user dash tag dot TSX file. And at this point, you know, the drill, this is a simple component. So you can find it in the readme down below, paste it and save it. And it looks like this file has a problem with the custom avatar. So let's remove this import. And let's just automatically import it by double clicking and then pressing control space and getting it from dot dot slash custom avatar. This was the default export. So now we're doing it properly. Let's reload. And it looks like we have to go to the edit dot TSX right now of the tasks, 
as that's also the named import. So once again, usually whenever you have a convention like doing the named imports or exports or default imports and exports, just make sure to stick with one. In the case of this video, we have been kind of mixing them around and you can see that it's not the best practice. So you can learn from me in this case. Um, but what we need to do now, and you can see it right here, I'm really glad we're getting a chance to debug through all of these issues, is you can go to the app.tsx line 23. So similarly, what we have done with the create, we've just reverted it back to the default. We can do the same with the edit. So right here, if I go over to the edit task, I can remove this export const at the top and just make it export default tasks edit page at the bottom. Export default tasks edit page. With that, we can reload. And finally, we are back to our list. I know this was quite interesting to fix all of these issues, but hey, we have done it. Uh, and I'm glad we're able to go through this debugging process together. Maybe you even caught some of the issues or bugs before I did, in which case, great job. So let's now close all of the currently open files and let's simply expand our browser. With the addition of these new components we've added, now the add new card should be there. We have tested that already, but just let's test it once again by saying something like finish my grade dashboard and save. This indeed does work, but now the moment of truth is if I go here and if I press view card, it actually opens it up. Or could we make it so that I can actually click it? That would be interesting because right now I can just drag and drop them. Well, back in our card dot TSX, in one place, we use this stop propagation thing, which was right here in the dropdown, I believe. There we go. We stop the propagation, but only on the button. Now let's see if we can do the other way around right here. If we click the text, we should be able to navigate to the details. So if I scroll a bit up right under items, we can also add the on pointer down, which is going to be set to a callback function where we get the event and we can stop the propagation. So we can say E dot stop propagation and also on click. So right here on click, we can also pass an event or rather get an event that we clicked on and say E dot Dom event dot stop propagation. So now if we do it, this part is working a bit better, but the title is still not clickable. So what we can do is modify this on click right here within the card and it's using the edit. And remember what edit is edit is coming directly through use navigation. So we can simply say edit or go to the edit of tasks for this specific ID and replace the current URL. So if we save this, it will actually open up the edit. So now if we're not drag and dropping it, it will be completely clickable and it will open up the complete form where let's test it. Let's try to finish this great dashboard by selecting a stage. Let's add it to in review for now. Let's add a description. We have a complete markdown description right here where you can say something like bullet points and you can say implemented. And then we can open up bullet points like dashboard. We can also add companies and tasks and you can press save. That's great. We can mark it as complete. We can add a due date. Let's say that it is today. Make sure to press OK and press save. And we can assign this to our current user, which is the admin user. Now, if you look at this card, it should have automatically been moved right here to in review. And I think it's safe to say that we can drag it over to finish my great dashboard as done. This is it. It definitely took some time, but I believe this was a phenomenal learning experience for all of these live features, the Kanban board, the dashboards and, and companies and tables and even more stuff. It's so crazy to see that the Kanban is actually just a part of the dashboard, whereas usually it is a complete separate application like Jira or Trello. And here you have it. You have just implemented it as yet another route. 
So finally, it's time to get our project live and in front of other people. And to do that, we'll deploy it on the internet. So head over to GitHub, press this plus and create a new repository. Give it a name, something like refine underscore dashboard. In this case, we'll do and make it either public or private. In this case, I'm going to leave it as public and press create repository. Next, we can put this side by side by our code base and we can open up our terminal, delete this one and stop the other one from running. We can clear it as well and we can just follow the commands to get our project deployed. That is git init, git add dot, git commit dash m, initial commit. Then we can copy a few ones from here, git branch m dash main, git remote add origin and git push u origin main. Just like that, if we now expand our browser, you'll be able to see all of the code you've been working so hard to create. There we go. It's right here. Now that we have our code deployed, let's head over to Vercel. As you can see, I have quite a few projects right here. Some of them are YouTube projects and most of them belong to our masterclass, which is a dedicated JavaScript mastery bootcamp where we don't teach people how to develop projects. We let them develop them and then provide them additional mentoring. So if you want to join, the link is going to be down in the description. But with that said, let's click add new and let's click new project. Vercel should automatically recognize the new repo we had. There we go. Refine dashboard and you can simply click import. And that's it. Just click deploy. It's as easy as it can be. Let's give it a minute until it does its thing. And hopefully we'll be able to see our web application live on the internet. But it looks like not everything goes so smoothly. Here we have some issues with TypeScript, which is totally okay. It's a huge application. And we were trying to follow TypeScript as close as possible, but it is possible we missed a few. We're only human, right? So what we can do here is I think the way to disable TypeScript on deployment on Vite is to modify environment variables. So let me go back to my projects and there should be a new project right here for, the, for you as well. Refine dashboard, go to settings, go to environment variables, and then add TSC as in TypeScript, compile on error and set it to true. This should allow your app to compile even if we have some small TypeScript errors and save it. Also, I noticed that we still have this refine thing at the top. And since we're deploying our app, it might be a good chance to remove it. Let's go back to our code, specifically to the app.tsx. Scroll down and here we can find where we have that refine bar. I think it's this one, GitHub banner. We can remove it and that's going to change the bar. Right now, our local host is closed, which is why it's not making any changes. But in deployment, it will have changes. And finally, we have to modify a small thing with our testing suite right here. And that is within utilities, date. And then here, DayJS provided us a testing suite. But in case we just want to get our app deployed right now, we can remove this testing suite. And now we should have no problems with deployment. So let's simply run git add dot, git commit dash M, and let's say fix errors, and then git push. This push will now remove this stop bar. It will also remove that test, allowing us to proceed. And finally, it will redeploy the app on Vercel, which will reapply the new environment variables. So let's give it a minute and see how does it go. And unfortunately, it looks like we still have some TypeScript errors right here, the same ones from before. So let's maybe not be so lazy and let's try to see what this is really about. I think the majority of these TypeScript errors are within the list.tsx. So if we navigate over to list.tsx, I do believe it's the one regarding the company. Yeah, so it's list.tsx for the company. And here we can see values. The type is unknown on search. And that's because we didn't properly provide the types of what's going to be coming to this table. So to do that, we can do this. We can open up a new TypeScript block and then say get 
fields from list and then define the company's query or company's list query specifically and close it like here. And then we also need to specify the HTTP error, which looks like this coming from refine dev core. And finally, one more time, get fields from list. We have to do it just due to the fact of how the use table works and what does it return. So now if we do that, it's no, it will no longer complain about the values. Let's see if we have some other problems or was this the only thing? I think this is related to tasks here. So this is in the pages tasks list as well. So let's navigate over to tasks list. And here we have one error at the top, which is right here complaining about the grouped. When defining the task stage right here, I think I just automatically imported it from GraphQL schemas, but we have to modify it a tiny bit right here. So I'm gonna remove that import and I'm gonna right here at the top, define a type of task first of all, which is equal to get fields from list and then task query. We're getting the fields from the tasks query list and only then can we define a type for the task stage right here, which we do by getting fields from list, but this time task stages query. So task stages query, there we go. And we can also say, and tasks is an array of individual tasks. So if we do this right now, we can remove this empty import, which we're not using and we can now use this new task stage as the type and it's no longer complaining. So we can close these two files. And since we weren't lazy developers, we can go back to settings and then environment variables. And we can remove this environment variable, which we added, which didn't work anyway. So it's not like it really matters, but hey, we fixed it now. I thought there was gonna be more TypeScript errors considering the size of the project, but thankfully we just had two. So finally, let's say git add, git commit dash M, let's say fix TypeScript and git push. Vercel will automatically try to requeue and redeploy our deployment. So let's check it out. Third time's the charm. And there we go. If you click right here on this build, or if you just go to the project, maybe even better, you'll be able to click visit to see your project deployed and live on the internet. In this case, we can log in as Michael Scott one more time, and there we go. A full complete dashboard connected to the backend greets us with the upcoming events data, latest activities, and even all of the companies right here working in real time. But the part that I'm most proud of is of course the Kanban tasks board, where we can move things around move them to unassigned and even create new cards, not to mention the markdown updates. Overall, the build of this app has been a huge success. I know it wasn't easy, but we've done it. I hope you learned a lot about building big and scalable applications. It's a completely different thing, building a small dashboard and just making it work and then building something that has the potential to scale to hundreds of pages. This is how I perceive this app. It truly does have that potential because of all of the features that are exposed and provided to us by Refine. With that said, huge thanks to Refine, not only for sponsoring this video, but for building such an amazing open source tool. Also, if you came to the end of this video, you are the perfect fit for our ultimate courses. Here, we've been building everything using Veet, but I'm sure you wanna dive into the latest and greatest of what Next.js 14 offers. And I'm not talking just about using Next.js like you would use React. I'm talking using it to the fullest potential, making sure that you get all of the out of the box SEO benefits and learn how to use Next.js in depth. You'll go through deep dive lectures to understand how things truly work then you'll build an incredibly complex app. In this case, that's gonna be our dev overflow, which is a complete stack overflow clone and will also have active lessons that allow you to practice your knowledge in real time to ensure that you never get stuck in the tutorial hell.
simply go to jsmastery.pro or click the link in the description. With that said, once again, huge thanks to you for coming to the end of this video and have a wonderful day.